So welcome to the third day of Olympic racing at Kiel Week 2019. And we are going to go straight into the action with the first race of the Gold Fleet Finals for the Women's 49er FX. My name is Andy Rice and with me is class expert, class manager, in fact, Ben Ramoka. Uh, ben, it's extremely light, the lightest we've seen. It's also quite warm. The breeze has been fighting uh, two breezes have been uh, fighting with each other all day, which is why we haven't come on air as soon as we are now. 20 seconds to go. Would you have any idea which side might be paying with the breeze swinging around the way it is? Uh, well, I don't, Andy. It's uh, it's sea breeze fighting the uh, gradient wind, so we won't know till we get racing. So they're just about to start. Okay, they're just starting now. And very, very slow start. Germans doing very well off this end of the line. Yeah, that's uh, Germany 55, Victoria Yersok and Annika Lorenz are our dominant leaders so far. These two uh, locals have extended very well in the heavy wind racing of the first two days and have a 20 point lead on the competition and uh, they're not giving it up yet but we do see one of the Dutch boats uh, sneaking out with a good start farther down the line so there'll be a lot of teams who should be able to get off this line and, and sail well. And uh, the two top German boats going out opposite ways so Germany 29 on the right of the picture uh, well now you can see the replay Germany 29 is going to tack off very soon after the start clearly Tina Lutz and Suzanne Boyka wanted the right hand side so they go into attack fairly soon whereas Germany 55 um, they are uh, Victor sorry Victoria Jurtsok Annika Lawrence they get a great start and are able to carry on and out towards the left hand side yeah, Tina Lutz and Susan Boyka were the 2017 European champions from this venue, and they are also local. So uh, we can expect that they would have an idea of what they want to do, and, and maybe we should be listening to it. So uh, very well uh, executed from them. They wanted the boat, they wanted to get right, and they've done it so far in the front row. So uh, that's a pretty powerful position to be in. So Lutz Boyka tacked out right, Germany 29 in the lead at the moment followed by British boat helmed by um, Megan Brickwood and Germany 29 in very clear air which you need to have yeah, it's incredibly right now right now this is just about the lightest you can sail in you can see skippers now sitting on roughly center line crews doing any adjustment if there is any to be necessary but once those skippers take a seat you know it's extremely light Yotzot Lawrence doing okay in the middle of the track along with Beckering Dutz from the Netherlands, the reigning world champions. But out on this side, there's a bit of a, a Danish contingent doing well. Idebaud Nielsen and Marie Olsen amongst those. But on the far, far left, actually on the right of our screen, but going out left uh, is Melzaka and Lobeda. Looking strong at the moment. So... Too early to say at the moment which side's going to pay out, left or right. Vilma Bobek and Malin Tengstrom, third overall going into today from Sweden. Somewhere in the middle and some way back. You know who's done well here are the Italians, Raggio and Germani. Um, they had to... They weren't quite on the front row when they when they tacked out and had uh, Lutz and Boyka on top of them, but they managed to get their speed uh, to the point where they have a clear lane now and aren't threatened. So uh, they're now the farthest, uh, or they're, they're just below this boat we're looking at here, Lutz and Boyka. And you can see Lutz and Boyka. Lutz is on the trapeze now, and and, and Boyka is outside the the center of the boat. So it's not quite the lightest possible condition. Um, this is, this is a condition that you know you can definitely move in. There's, you can see it's bouncing quite a bit. There's a, there's a number of other boats in Kiel Week going to and from race courses. So uh, while there won't be any wind waves, there there can be waves from other uh, coach boats and other sailboats heading to and from the courses. Nice so, smooth tack there from this duo. And the uh, helm handing the main sheet to the crew up the front of the boat. That took a, a, a bit of a switch around for some people to get used to the idea of the helm giving up control of the mainsail to the crew. It, it's an established part of 49er skiff sailing for the last 20 years, but 
just that shot there just reminded me of uh, just how strange that felt in the early days. And it's, it's a much more even balance of responsibilities between the helm and the crew in a skiff like the 49er FX compared with more conventional boats like the 470. You know, what, what I'm curious about is why Lutz and Boyka have gone across here. Um, you know, they, they're winning their side, but, you know, this picture makes it look like the far side is looking very dangerous here. The far left that we, you know, we can't work out. There we go. Now we, we've got it on the 3D, but uh, it does, to me, up to my eye, it looked a tiny bit windier on that far side, and maybe Lutz and Boyka have decided that uh, that they haven't gone the right way, and they, they at least want to get back a little bit and, and not give it all up. So, um, you well, know. We, we saw on that overhead graphic just then that they were already well on their way to getting across towards the right-hand side, and um, they, they're crossing most of the boats that they've already got ahead of, but will they? how will they square up against these that have gone far left in the early stages? Mel Zakara and Lobeda currently looking very good. Yeah, you can see we're already three quarters of the way up the beat here. Um, so Lutz and Boyka aren't going to be able to go past this group. They're just trying to shorten the gap and, and get across. So you can see also Lutz, uh, Lorenz and uh, Jersok uh, haven't done that well from going up the left-ish side. So I think uh, our locals have, haven't got, quite got it right here, and they're going to end up uh, being beaten by the teams that went off the pin and went straight. But, you know, having moved the whole time and been in clear air the whole time, uh, that will be worth something. So we're hearing that uh, the race is going to be abandoned and that will come as a great relief to the Italians that we see bottom of shot who look absolutely dead in the water. Maria Raggio and Jana Germani. You can see why Lutz and Boyka wanted to get out of the right-hand side when they did and, and so that was a, a good bail by the Germans to, to get out when they, when they did. But if this race is going to be abandoned and there you can see the blue and white checkered flag going up on the committee boat, so uh, that race is canned. And well, I'm not sure how much we learned from that, Ben. No, um, we learned that it's incredibly light, and um, our meteorologist here in Kiel uh, told us that the two winds, the um, the gradient wind, which we've had the last two days, will be fighting this sea breeze, and and he showed us just how incredibly uh, weak the gradient wind is. So, with a late sea breeze and a light gradient wind fighting each other, I think it was a it's going to be squirrely no matter what. And obviously, our race officer decided that this wasn't going to be a fair enough contest. Okay, well, that's a bit disappointing after what has been a fantastic last week or so of uh, of Kiel, um, but you can't have it. Um, can't have it perfect all the time. It looks like it's going to get hotter over the coming days and um, and the breeze will be coming back as well. So will California be coming back over the next couple of days? We see here confirmation that the race is abandoned and uh, that's our race officer boat going with that checkered flag that can either be so upsetting if you're in the lead or, or such a welcome relief if you haven't had a good race. So uh, that, that's confirmation that the race has been blown off. And quite frankly, with how light it is uh, here, I think the FX fleet might be uh, in, for a, in for a fairly long wait on the water. I wouldn't think we're going to get straight back into another race. This, doesn't, uh, this wasn't an abandonment because that race was particularly unfair. It was an abandonment because it was just too light to race, wasn't it, Andy? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was probably a fair call. Uh, unfortunately, 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago, it looked pretty nice. The boats were moving well through the water. And uh, you can see why they were sent out there. But, um, yeah, clutching at straws at the moment to try and get a race in. And the, the 49ers and the NACRAs and the, the other classes sitting on shore won't be at all envious of the, the, uh, the women in the 49er FX sitting out here on the water. Albeit it is a lovely day for sunbathing here in Peel. <laughs> a lovely day for sunbathing, bathing, but these, uh, these duos will all have long wetsuits on, but it is nice and cool on the water, so they won't be struggling too much. Um, now, we're, to, we're talking about, in, in, instead of uh, just uh, talking about what we see, maybe going back to what we saw yesterday, which was the NACRA 17s. Uh, we had some fantastic racing from yesterday, so I'm, go I'm going to wait for a tee up from... from so, okay, so we're going to go to race two of the NACRAs from yesterday very shortly. So this is going to be shocking based on what you're seeing because there's going to be a ton of wind coming in for yesterday's exciting racing and, oh, straight into it. So we're 50 seconds into the start of the NACRAs 
and the breeze is still blowing nicely. Um, now we've seen that the pin has been a strong place to start, so who's going to be fighting for this pin? It looks like Russia 3-4-5 at this stage could be, uh, could be vying for that spot. And how many will we see trying the port tack start underneath the fleet, which also has proven pretty powerful at times. We've seen yeah, most boats are lined up on starboard here as we get just 20 seconds to go. There's not a very big line sag, so uh, it's quite tight. And we'll see if some of these top teams uh, bail out. Oh, there we see the Spanish Pacheco and uh, Florian Triddle bailing out. They're going to try a port tack start. Very close on the line there with that one German. Four seconds to go. Okay, so they are launching off the line and it's going to be Finland that wins the pin. They just have to squeeze round the edge of the boat, but Spain doing the port tack start, managing to get ahead of, of a couple of boats, ducking their way through. The Swedes also tacking, a very slow tack for the Swedes. Will they be able to get across that boat at the back? Yes, they have. But meanwhile, at the front, Finland. Sinan Kirtby, very good start there. Able to win the pin end of the, uh, of the line and get out and reach to full speed right away. Just above uh, her is Koloff and Stuhlhammer, uh, top German team. Germany 77 there, so they're in a fast mode already, um, pressuring uh, the finish uh, a little bit. So, uh, so good starts from them. You know, there was a bulge in the line at, at just a at go, so I wonder if uh, one of those two German boats was over the line in that race, but we'll have to find out in a little bit. Okay, Back up to yeah. speed here from Finland, and, and we can see yeah, Kolhammer ex extending. And considering the good start that the Finns had off the pin end, just look at the extra lick of pace that Kolhoff and Stulema have. And just to the far end of the screen, you can see Spain. That was uh, Pacheco and Trittle who are, who are leading the pack to the right. So already huge divergence, and uh, we see the two boats who are uh, first left and first right uh, able to uh, you know, do really well on the boats in the middle. In terms of raw boat speed through the water on this side of the track, just look at that yellow line extending away for Koloff and Stulema. Vasaro and Frascari also going out that way, but a more conservative start. And Pacheco and Trittel leading the charge out to the right-hand side. So they're making that, um, well, we'll see it again. Their bottom right hand of picture now, they'll come into screen very soon. There's the Spanish boat accelerating looking to start behind the rest of the fleet, but there's one fly in the ointment. It's that boat that's starting late. Might be an Austrian, I'm not sure. Very controlled starting there from the Spanish. Very impressive how they uh, held up and just picked their timing so they weren't too early or too late uh, to get behind the fleet comfortably, and that's one of the ways they're being successful with these port deck option starts. You well, see them just holding up, checking the gaps, double-checking that they're going to be able to get across the Austrians. So very impressive from Pacheco and Trittle. And look how it's worked out for them on the right-hand side. The line turns red. I can also confirm, Andy, that uh, two of those German boats were OCS in the middle of the line. So oh, only, wow, which only, ones? So that was... Um, uh, I mean, um, surely not Koloff and Stuhlhammer, were they... I mean, they no, were... not Koloff and Stuhlhammer. It was Polgar and Werner, as well as the um, third boat, Amula and Stuckel. So oh. big, uh, big development there with, uh, with that uh, OCS. And I think, is, is that uh, Mula and uh, Stuckel yes. that we see there? So they won't know that. They probably think they're having a fantastic race as they cross another of the Germans. That could well be Polgar and Werner. So the two boats we saw in shot just then, from what Ben says may well be out of this race and as they race along charging along this young german crew have no idea maybe they have some idea that they might be out of this race they'll certainly have known they were close anyways so um the boat with omen on its sail a bad omen for germany 468 mulen stuckel still they're racing away, seemingly oblivious to the fact, and they're having a fantastic race right now. They're one of the younger teams, um, probably not expected to be able to qualify for Tokyo 2020 next year. That battle, more down to the other boat that's been, been called over, Polgar and Werner, and also um, Koloff and Stulema, who were our overnight leaders, currently wearing the yellow jersey, and as we speak at the moment, doing just over 12 knots and leading race five as we speak. Good positioning here from Kirtby and Keskinen. We saw them uh, get the win the pin and then be placed under a bit of pressure from Koloff Stuhlhammer, but they've uh, managed to get the shifts and, and keep themselves in a good position, uh, even though maybe not quite as much pace as the leading Germans. Just coming, having the two fleets come together again, so uh, Pacheco and Trittel going to 
oh, so Kurt Bay and Keskin have, have under-tacked this fleet that's uh, done well on the right, and Koloff and Stulemer have tacked back as well. So obviously a right shift coming in from that side uh, quite late up this beat, and, uh, and the teams are going to take the lift to the left top corner. Good race for Kurt Bay and Keskinen from Finland. And Moulin Stuckel also in amongst that fight, but it doesn't matter because they're out of this race, as is Polgar and uh, Werner, who are in front of picture at the moment, just ducking behind the Finns. Very nice duck there behind the Germans, uh, behind the Finns. And now the Germans have got a couple of other starboard tackers to think about. Doesn't look like they're going to be able to cross the Spanish. The Spanish are going to cross in front of them. So... Pacheco and Trittel tacking right on the face of Germany 369. But there is another German boat right up there. Koloff and Stulema. Look how tall Koloff is compared with Alisa Stulema. Oh. And further Nothing. over, this looks like the Russians on the right hand side. And that is Mullen Stuckel. The young Germans still oblivious to the fact that they were called over early on the start line. No, it's such a shame uh, for a young team to be doing well in a race uh, and, and it end, won't end up counting. But at this moment, they'll be thrilled uh, with the where they've sailed this beat. And uh, it's a good opportunity for them to race at the front. We see uh, Pacheco and Trittel uh, in line there. They're looking, looking you know, like they're in a good lane here. And, Look who uh, this, this is, is on the, the left. Italians, Pizarro and Frascari. Uh, first time we've seen them up in the front group, so they've made some gains on the far left. They, they made an average start out the middle of the line, fairly conservative. I mean, uh, we've seen a fantastic pace from them already. Um, so maybe they're, they're not starting quite as daringly as some of the other boats, but look at the speed that Germany 77 is coming over the top of Italy. Koloff and Strulem have got something to say about Italian boat speed. It looks like Koloff might just be able to get into this windward mark in first place. The Spanish in the background tacking on the ley line, but it's Koloff and Strulem. Let's have a look at their hoisting style. The blue Jenica already out towards the tack line. And Strulema already hoisting that uh, Jenica before they've even completed the barrel way, but they're yet to get up on the hydrofoils. They made a really wide turn there so they could get the spinnaker up even earlier than uh, might have been expected. So quite a long route uh, and then an early hoist. Okay, Strulema taking a while to get onto the trapeze there, but finally she joins Paul Koloff looking back to see how the Italians have got on with their hoist, but can't look around for too long because you've got to keep that delicate, sea delicate seesaw balance. Around go the Finns, around go the Norwegians. The Finns lost quite a few spots there in the top half of the speed. They'll be disappointed after sailing uh, so well at the beginning of this race. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how they managed to do that. that that's quite surprising. Oh, well, you look at it, it's not so bad, but they're down to about seventh there, just behind the Russians. Koloff and Stulema ahead of Bissaro and Frascari. Now, we've seen the speed of Bissaro and Frascari. Will Koloff and Stulema wearing the yellow jerseys be able to hold off the Italians, who only just a couple of weeks ago won the Hempel World Cup Series in a variety of conditions down in Marseille, very much one of the form teams in the World NACRA 17 fleet right now. Early oh, jibe by Koloff and Stulema. In, yeah, interesting that they jibed off there and, and allowed the opportunity for this split because uh, uh, we've, we, we expect Bizarre and Frascari to be quite quick and now, uh, and now they're also going to have leverage. So hopefully Koloff and Stulema have seen something worth chasing and, uh, and they'll go off and get it. But now there's a lot of leverage between these uh, two boats downwind. Looks like a jibe setting up for the Italians, rolling through a jibe, bit of windward heel. Pretty smooth, get that but Jenica not too set. quick, yeah. Okay, helm out. Oh, hang on. Oh, Frascari. Yellow she's helmet in. in the water. She's and fallen in. The Italian boat turns up back round. We're with the Spanish now, just about to go into a jibe. But what is going on with that Italian boat? Look, you can see you can see the yellow helmet in the water. So they're already close together. Hopefully, um, hopefully the, she can be recovered quickly as uh, Bizarro gets that boat. Um, well, is he going to be able to get close enough upwind whilst flying the Jenica to be able to get back to the crew? That's the question. And it looks like they've managed that already. So already Frascari back on the boat. She's Ooh, lying down on not the... Not looking good. Looks like she's in a bit of pain there. They're, not, they're certainly not jumping straight back into the race. So that's not very good. So we wait and see. So oh, there, there oh, is... Oh, you can see she's in a lot of pain. That's, uh, I hope she's okay here. This is, could be relatively serious. Uh, at least she's back on the boat, but um, 
Bassara is basically sailing the boat single-handed. He got the Jenica down by himself. Uh, Frascari uh, laid out on the trampoline. That's quite concerning. Um, back up at the front of the fleet, Koloff and Strulemer, they thought they were going to be in a match race with those Italians before that incident. Uh, but now uh, the Germans have a bit of breathing space as they come down to the bottom turning mark of this three lap race for the first time. Spanish still very much in contention. And there's a replay of that, so that's from the on board. And, and we saw, it looks to me, Ben, like um, everything was under control and Frascari had hooked up on the trapeze, but maybe hadn't hooked up properly and, and maybe hadn't connected. Yeah, it looked like everything was you know, perfectly under control. And then all of a sudden, as she went overboard to, uh, to trapeze, you know, it wasn't clipped in and, and just slipped right over the side of the boat. So you know, it shows how quickly things can go wrong uh, because basically everything was perfectly fine up until the moment uh, she wasn't clipped in. So, uh, well, we'll bring you more news of, uh, of progress with the Italians. Uh, we, we hope that's not the last of them uh, for this regatta. But you know, it is possible to get quite badly injured sailing these boats at times. We hope that's not a case of that today. Um, so one German coming out underneath the other. Um, that is uh, Mullen Stuckel to Leward. And it's, you can uh, see how low they're going as they're trying to get clear air below uh, the Finnish boat there, Kirkby. And as the other boat, Polgar, he, he's looking for his high lane. Uh, to, so a couple different options as you come around the mark. So vital to have clear air and, and the two German boats there going either side of the fin to look for their version of clear air. Uh, oh, and we see uh, back of the front, uh, uh, Pacheco and Trittle have tacked off. So trying to get some more separation. Oh, the Germans tack right back to match them. So uh, no, uh, no space given here from the leading Germans. Koloff and Stuhlemmer. So uh, already Koloff and Stuhlemmer able to think in defensive terms. They obviously consider the Spanish to be the closest threat for them, for them being able to overtake them. Um, it's, quite, it's quite a different setup between the German and the Spanish boat on board the German boat now that we're looking at with the yellow jerseys. Pau Koloff, very tall. Alisa Stulema much shorter. She's, she's the engine though, she's the one putting in most of the work into the German boat. By contrast, Tara Pacheco, former 470 world champion, quite slight, quite small, and the powerhouse in her boat is up the front, is Florian Trittel, the, uh, the kite boarder who's made the transition to the NACRA fleet. So uh, a nice illustration of just how you can sail the NACRA 17 different ways round, boy and girl, front and back or back and front. Yeah, it's been very impressive. Uh, Tara Pacheco was sailing with Fernando Echevarri, crewing for Fernando uh, Echevarri, the 2008 Olympic champion, until quite recently. And then Fernando decided uh, he, he'd had enough in his... Oh, here we are, back in... Uh, okay, so... Have, have a look Vittorio. at that boat on the left. Yeah, Vittorio's... Okay, so Miles in the uh, first aid boat. Doubled up. Doubled up, but it doesn't... They're not rushing to shore or anything. It doesn't look... It doesn't... You know, no one's scrambling uh, to do anything too dramatic. So it does look like things might be okay on the relative scale. So how do you sail a NACRA 17 around by yourself? That seems to be what uh, Vittoria Bizarra has to do right now. It was very impressive how quickly he was able to pick her up. I mean, yeah. it's Jenica up. It's relatively windy here, 20 knots, but it's uh, up to 20 knots in the puffs and flat water. And, uh, you know, he was able to pick her up uh, very quickly. And uh, we should just note that the Spanish bottom of picture right now have overtaken the Germans for the lead. So uh, Koloff was right to be cautious about the Spanish. Now, he, 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 he's by no means given up this race yet, but there has been a lead change, and now it's Pacheco and Trittle who hold the lead coming out towards the left-hand side. A split developing between the top two, and look at those Norwegians out on the far side. Martinson and Mortensen, a bit of a threat on the right, along with the Japanese. Yeah, we saw the passing lane on that last beat was uh, at the top left, but uh, I think because it's offshore, it'll be so shifty. Uh, we won't necessarily uh, count on that as a trend, so we've got to hope that your side's the one with the good, the good angles and the good puffs, as we can see on the virtual. Koloff and Stuhlemmer have retaken the lead, and they're now... Oh, oh, yeah. We can see how they're in a light spot here, it looks like, the Spanish. It looks like it. I mean, Trittel only just dropping down on the trapeze, so he was very high on his wire until just a moment ago. Um, now Tara Pacheco also dropping down on the trapeze. They're obviously coming in some more wind and the breeze. The speed is, uh, is building on that Spanish boat, as you can see. But uh, maybe it just dropped a bit soft, and um, while they were going through that tack, it, it looked like uh, they, they were in a bit of a light spot. 
Yeah, let me just finish up about uh, the Spanish background. So uh, Fernando Echevarri retired, and then Tara Pacheco moved to the back of the boat and pulled in Florian Trittel, one of the top uh, uh, co uh, foiling kite surfers in the world, to be crew. And, and they're already they've, they've actually been competitive right from the f uh, first times they started sailing together. So they're uh, you know been sailing very well all season, and they're only six months into this partnership. Um, so it speaks to the strength of the Spanish sailing, and, and of course to uh, what uh, Tara was able to uh, know from her previous camp and learn from Fernando about cat sailing. Now, Florian Trittle doesn't sound like a typically Spanish name to me, but he is actually a, a Spanish passport holder. Oh, yeah. I think he's a full Spanish. Full yeah. Spanish, Pro <laughs> speaks proper Spanish. Absolutely. Yeah, because the, uh, the other Spanish boat, not here, Ica Martinez, and very Spanish name. And Olga Maslovets doesn't sound very Spanish to me. Yeah, Olga does hold mas multiple passports, and she's competed for uh, the Ukraine and Russia in the past. But um, wow, tricky so situations over there, and she's been living in Spain for quite a long time now. So decided to um, move over uh, from boat. Quite, quite a close cross here. Yeah, so this is the battle for first and second right there. And normally you would say that Germany, well, they won that cross, but they have at least one more tack to do. Oh, no, they don't because they're on the ley line and the Spanish have just tacked on their weather hip so that's advantage Germany uh, yeah, well sailed by the Germans here to uh, protect those advances by the Spanish. The Spanish have tried all sides of them. They tried, they tacked early to the go to the right, then they went extended to the left. But uh, the Germans have uh, held their nerve and gone a more conservative route, basically straight up the middle of the course, just fewer tacks, and uh, and now hold the lead into this top mark. They also, as a boat, look a little bit more powered up to me than the Spanish. Um, they look a bit more stretched more of the time. The fins coming in here, so the fins have done very well on the left hand side. Jenica just beginning to come out on the uh, German boat now, Germany 77 already with the blue Jenica. The Spanish in second place right on their heels and the Finns right behind them, bit riding up a little bit wildly there at the moment, but up onto the foils early. Paul Koloff at the back of the boat and just being joined by Elisa Stulema. The Spanish with a good hoist, round go the Finns still very much in the hunt also. For, uh, for maybe being able to win this race. They're in third at the moment with a nice gap back, so the Finns can think about going on the attack on the Spanish and the Germans in front of them. So the Germans there have jibed on what looks like a huge shift because they're heading straight at the finish line here. Uh, if that holds, or if they... Well, hang on, yeah, remember this is a three-lapper. It's, it's not a two-lapper like the 49ers do, so... That's right. I believe we've got another leg, uh, lap of this race to do yet. So there's still time for the so Spanish to be able to attack the Germans. It's quite a header they're on. They're, they're going very deep here, so uh, not a lot of opportunities passed. We see the first jibe setter in Zajek and Mats, and then... Uh, Are you remember, Martinson and Mortensen were all, already, I'm uh, sorry, um, almost making the gain line for the lead halfway up that last beat out on the far right-hand side. So as you say, a big header, um, and, and it's gone against them. So, you know, from being vying for the lead, suddenly the Norwegians are way back in seventh or eighth. So big see, shifts out there. We can see the high, uh, the high foiling style from Koloff and Stuhlheimer. They really push hard downwind. Watch Alicia uh, dance back and forth at the front of the uh, boat here to keep it in tune as they try and keep those hulls from hitting the water, but also try and make sure they don't leap out and crash. So uh, constant dance. I mean, it's like a metronome. They're going back and forth uh, on a second-by-second -second basis. In for their jibe. Okay, let's nice see how high. this goes. Whoa! 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 <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to see a repeat of the uh, the Italian jibe, but uh, they managed to save it. What do you think happened there, Ben? Uh, I, th I think maybe when uh, when Paul was turning the tiller extension around the back, he, he pushed it a little too far. But Alyssa, Alyssa was cool as a cucumber. She was back out on the wire and as if nothing had happened. So I, I guess it's not the first time uh, they've had an upset like that during a jibe. Uh, well recovered from what looked like a pretty precarious position and straight back on those foils. No fear. Well, to me, they look like they're riding a little bit higher on the foil a lot of the time. Do you think that's why maybe that jibe was a little bit sketchy because they're, they're, they're sort of pushing the edges of the foils a little bit more than other people? I mean, it could be. The, the first half of the jibe looked you know, great though, so I, I think it was an upset in the middle as opposed to a style necessarily, but uh, um, yeah, you wouldn't want to do that in your jibes too often, uh, but you see how quickly he recovered, so got upset and he's still, they're going so fast that a quick rudder motion, he was able to turn the boat very quickly and, and recover, so and already at the bottom of the course, uh, you know, it seems like just a moment ago they hoisted. It does. I mean, it seems like that was only two minutes ago, if that. So very, very fast down the track, and maybe partly due to the fact of what you said earlier, Ben, that there's been a bit of a shift, 
and most of the running on that uh, downwind leg was made on starboard jibe. But the Spanish, still right behind them, still yeah, very much a, in the fight. Making a game of this one. It's uh, basically how we rounded the last uh, lap. So an entire lap's gone by, and, the, and these two have uh, exchanged the lead once uh, each, but, uh, but find themselves in the same situation. So we'll see if the Spanish continue to go on the attack or not. Well, they've shown every capability of doing so, but they, the two of them pulled about 50 meters out on uh, the tri on the Finns, who were who were very close to them before this leg started. So the two leading boats, uh, you know, extended their their advantage over the chasing pack. But uh, Thomas Zajac did well on his jibe set. He's closed the gap a little bit. So there's, there's a few routes downwind here. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought Kurt Van Kesten and Keskinen were going to be all about the attack. They, they had a big gap back to the rest of the fleet, and that has been swallowed up in the space of two minutes on that down. Leg. So I don't know what went wrong for the Finns, but they are now fighting for that third place. It's by no means a given. Now, repeating that, for, uh, that, that, that previous lap, the Spanish tack and the, and the Germans waste no time in matching the tack. So they're not going to give them very much space to get leverage on this upwind, it seems. Dropping down onto their trapezes. I'm trying to think when they needed to be on high wire in the first place. Surely they're on low wire downwind as well. So why are they adjusting their wires so much? Uh, I think on the down, on the upwinds they do go very low on the trapeze because they kind of hide their windage behind the hulls, okay. or, or they, they, you know, they try and uh, they can be more consistent, uh, and they're also heeled over. Whereas on the down when they sail flat, so their their bodies are probably a little bit higher on the down. Okay, wind. okay. Yeah. So this time, Koloff and Stulema keeping a very close watch on the Spanish. They've got 131 meters back to the third place boat, Kurt Bay and Keskinen. So they've got a bit of a buffer. So at the moment, Germany can probably consider themselves to be in a match race with Spain. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Spanish are definitely putting them under pressure here. They've got, uh, it does look like they have slightly different styles. I'd say I'd say Pacheco and Triddle are, are a tiny bit higher and, uh, and Koloff and Stulem are, are a little more footing and, and pacey maybe, but uh, well, so maybe far they're locked, in, maybe they're locked in step here. It uh, could be that it's tactical, or it could be just a shift or something, but it, it, at this point, um, you know, they, they don't have a lot of separation between the two boats. I'd say, if anything, the Germans look a bit higher and faster there than the Spanish. They, they, they look like they've got the measures. So the Spanish are tacked off. What will the Germans do? Looks like the Germans are going for that tack. Yeah, no, uh, no space given, and nor should there be. Good looking tack there. They get the new hull out of the water and, and driving uh, early, and then they cross the boat. Someone's a bit late getting out onto trapeze on the German boat. They're not, I mean, the, certainly the, the Spanish are, are a bit heads up and, and not quite as. You know, they're just not trapping quite as hard as you might expect. I mean, I, I do think in this condition you'd want as much power as possible. So um, giving up a little bit there, you can see Al Alyssa's uh, body position is dead straight um, uh, on, on the German boat, whereas uh, both uh, Florian and, and Terra are a little bit heads up there. So a little bit different trapezing styles. Well, I know which one you prefer, Ben. You're a bit of a stickler for these trapezing styles. Yeah, well, uh, any any uh, windage gain you can have and any leverage gain you can have, you should take it every time uh, as long as you can still perform the job. But yeah, look at uh, very good uh, very good technique from these two. And you can see Paul probably can look over top of uh, Alyssa's head. Uh, yes. He's so tall. He's so uh, he's so tall. But uh, you know, it's a it's a good looking pair. A bit headed here. See, oh, the Spanish, Spanish do go for attack. So on the attack, and the, the, you know they've definitely closed up some distance there. That's a very t uh, tight duck this time. Uh, they've probably gained about half the distance they were behind at the leeward mark. Let's see what happens here. Uh, and if they, they they decided not to match as closely as we've seen, so well they've got to watch out for the Austrians also that are beginning to go on the attack as well. So Zajac and Mats. So maybe oh, hang on, what's this? Russia three four five. That's Zhenbev and. Uh, uh, Kiselova looks like they're out of this one, so that that's their day done. Yeah, Why would that have happened, Ben? Um, yeah, I mean it's a little bit rare for so high up. We, we have been seeing some tears in the mainsails a little lower down, but I guess it would be too much Cunningham on the downwind, uh, and the sail material just can't hold it. Uh, that, that'd be my guess, without having you know possibly it could have been the tear could have initiated maybe on a mast clash or something, but. Uh, um, you know, they certainly won't be able to recover from that and, and sail uh, without changing mainsails. So it's very disappointing uh, for it to happen in a race. 
Kolov and Stulemer re have regained the lead here with a left shift. We saw just before we broke away to that uh, Russian boat that uh, the virtual were showing Pacheco and Trittel in the lead, but uh, Kolov and Stulemer top left again. That's actually three beats in a row. Top, top left has done pretty well, so... Seems like the place to be, doesn't it? But now the question for the Spanish is, will they get something different on that starboard ley line? Will they find the means to attack? But it looks like there's a lift coming in further for the Germans on the left-hand side. So uh, Spanish have just gone for their attack, so must be getting close to ley line up there. And uh, we'll see. It's only a couple meters in it uh, you know, by the virtual. So we'll see which of these teams can lead round the final windward mark. I think they. Uh, I think the Spanish close. might have it. Looks like the Germans just. Uh, oh, they're going to attack underneath. Okay, so we've got. Uh, Make this a good one. May, yeah, exactly. Spanish on the charge. Look how close that is after being locked in step for a lap and a half. These two boats head into the final windward mark with nothing between them, and it'll be interesting to see uh, who can have the better set here and, and take the f initial advantage into this downwind because. Uh, we got diminutive girl about to go on the hoist off uh, against tall man. In, in Florian Trittel on the Spanish boat, um, so uh, who's going to have the superior hoisting technique? This is a critical part of the race right now. There's an opportunity for Spain to be able to roll over the top of Germany if they can pull off a decent hoist, but it looks like Germany is going to round ahead of the Spanish on the spacer leg. And they've got their tack line out already, so, uh, so everything's gone well so far. Alika goes in. Very quick hoist, a oh, little bit so up on the That was at the top air. of the mast very quickly, and now they're already foiling, so uh, rising to the occasion, Kolov and Stuhlhammer do fantastically Ooh, in yeah. that uh, set. Nothing light as good on the Spanish boat, so, uh, oh, yeah, they're higher and they're slower at the moment than the Germans, so... Look at that, neck and neck to a 30-meter lead at just one hoist, so uh, very impressive from Kolov and Stuhlhammer. Doing over 20 knots now, the Spanish yet to get over 18 knots, they're just over 18 knots now, but Germany up to 21 knots, and they look well in control. They've got such beautiful boat balance on that German boat. Yeah, we saw them uh, just go just an inch or two too high, and you could see the rounds of the bottom of the foil, and then they, they took a, a slight dip about 10 seconds ago, but, um, every, but since then they've been keeping it right in that sweet spot, which is... Uh, just in the vertical sections, both clear of the uh, water there and, and running on the horizontals and just keeping the angle exactly how they want it via boat, uh, via uh, body weight movement. So the two of them, you know, Paul taking small steps forward and backwards. Most of the responsibility here left with uh, Alika, Alyssa. So there's the gap now. Really, well, hundred meter gap basically, and uh, these two are neck and neck right into that wind mark. Shows the value of great boat handling when uh, when the pressure's on because it, you know just as easily could have been the opposite way uh, based on that hoist you'd, you'd expect. Although they have sailed very well in the straight line as well. And only occasionally does Falkolov dare to look over his shoulder just to check in with what's going on. My sense is that you have to be fully on this boat all the time. You, you let up your concentration for a moment and it's going to throw you off the horse. Yeah, the, the extra information you get isn't nearly as valuable as keeping foiling and smooth, I wouldn't think. So uh, any glances would have to be very quick ones. Uh, obviously, they've got a plan there, uh, jibing angles as well as we get close to the line and we see hopefully they... Uh, Get a slightly smoother one than the last time, which they do. They get through it, uh, although you know, big turn, big angle big turn, turn there. and not very fast out of it. So I mean, I almost wonder if they prefer that sketchy jive they did on the previous run. I wonder if it was just a little bit light as they left there, because now, oh, and we've got the Spanish. Uh, so that's why they jibed. Is uh, maybe not so much of a oh, bit of a touchdown by the Spanish then, and the Germans move forward, move forward, they edge forward very slightly, lets them off the hook slightly. Yeah, but uh, still very close here. It does look like there's a good breeze up on that right-hand side of the track, and the Germans really hitting their straps now. This is fantastic racing here. Look how close these two boats are as they're locked in step, both ripping downwind as quickly as they can. The weird thing is, normally the faster a boat, the more everyone steps to the back of the boat, but it's almost the opposite on the NACRA. The faster they're going, the further forward the crew seems to go along the hull. Yeah, the, the faster forward they go, the more lift comes out of the rudders, so the crew has to counteract that by, uh, by moving forward and taking the lift out uh, through gross angle. So it's, uh, it is counterintuitive to be going this fast and right at the front of the boat, uh, but they do, they're making it work. It was you know, you can see how much. Oh, as we just as I yeah. said, how much steady they are. They take a, a bit of a harder landing, but it still wasn't that hard. They they were able to recover quickly and, and touch down. And, and get they back take up the again. race win. I mean, fantastic for Kolov and Stulema.
Uh, they won two races on the first day, and now they've won that race just ahead of the Spanish. What a fantastic match race. Pushed hard all the way were Paul Karloff and Alyssa Stulema, the winners of that race that we see now by the Spanish, Tara Pacheco and Florian Trittle. And they must be breathing a sigh of relief and uh, taking a few gasps of air as well. I'm sure Alyssa Stulema is, must be incredibly hard work on these three lappers. Now coming down, it's the Austrians. Zajac and Max, they, uh, Max, they've got a jibe to put in. Oh, a bit sketchy across the line. Are they going to be able to hold on for that? Just about. And they only just hold off the Danes, Lynn Sentenholt and CP Lubeck. So, very dramatic finish. And across the line are the Finns. Kurt Bay, uh, so a little disappointing probably from them to have uh, fallen out of the lead group, but not too bad. I think this is uh, Matheson and Pedersen. Uh, from Denmark coming through. Okay, so that was uh, that was quite a race that uh, we followed yesterday, and um, the good news is that uh, we, we actually got to speak to Miley Frascari after the race. Um, yeah, and. Uh, and we uh, we were able to speak with Mile Fuscari, and she ended up be, being okay. Actually, just uh, hit her foot on the rudder on the way by. So, uh, um, you know, it, I'm it, sure it, sho it, shocking. And, and she was limping when she got in. But actually, uh, if we have time, uh, we're just waiting still here for the 49er FX racing as the 49er FX fleet is on course. And um, so uh, anyway, I, I understand that uh, we might be able to watch an interview with Vittorio Pissarro um, after yesterday's race and we can hear what he had to say. Important is the um, uh, issue she had uh, with uh, her left leg. But I, I think nothing major, nothing real, real serious happened. So finger crossed for tomorrow to be able to be back racing. Can you tell us what, what happened? What, what, what happened to you? We were fighting with Paul for top spot of the second race. And we had a very fast falling jibe. And after the jibe, it's important to put weight uh, fast on the trapeze. And probably when uh, she, uh, she was trying to be as fast as possible outside on trapeze, she missed the hook and just uh, dropped in the water. Can you tell us how dangerous is uh, sailing with the Nakra, especially on the foils? The boat is quite dangerous because uh, both, I mean, mostly the uh, rudder with the elevator is outside of the perimeter of the platform. So if you drop in the water, it happens many times that you can be eaten by the elevator. So it's quite dangerous. It's part of the game. We knew that. Everybody knew that. So we tried to change something, but uh, the Olympic campaign was quite too close to Tokyo to implement this new uh, modification on the boat. So as a sailor, I think that we made the right choice to keep with it, considering that we have to be aware of elevator, of course. I mean, to be in true is something, but the other thing is, what what does it make it in your mind? I mean, it's your teammate. You know my my life very well. What is in your in her mind now? Is she still okay there? Yeah, yeah. Is she scared or? We had she had another uh, very strong uh, uh, incident. Yeah, last season in the summer during the summer in the uh, end of May. So. I, Last time uh, we had to stop for more than one month and he, she had a very, very bad period of recovery. So at the beginning when this happened, I was very scared that uh, we, we were running to do the same things. But hopefully I saw that the situation is not different, is quite different. Last time she was straight to the hospital and now she, she's still okay. So I was scared, but I think it's a lot better than last time and I think it's the same for her. What can you do to protect her, or do you have to speak to her, or give her a hug, or what? What is your plan? What makes you her feel better? Uh, I think a hug, some, <laughs> <laughs> of course. No, just uh, 
let her know that uh, these things happen. It's important to push 100% all the time. And sometimes when you push 100%, uh, I made mistakes, she made mistakes, so it's part of the game. I'm not uh, angry, of course, with her. And I hope uh, she will uh, trust me that uh, there is no problem between us. It's just happened and we can go on the water tomorrow trying to do our best again. So we keep our fingers crossed for her as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So a very frank interview there with Vittorio Bassaro talking about uh, Maiali Frascari and that man overboard incident. And uh, yeah, I mean, his concern uh, was uh, how long they were going to be out of action for after being out of action for a, a month or so. He doesn't feel like that's going to happen, but it's, it's quite a matter of, matter of fact way of looking at the world, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's not much time for emotion there. It's it's about we've got Tokyo 2020. That's what we're both focused on, and and that's the setback that he's concerned about. Yeah, it's a, it's like there's three pieces of equipment: the boat, uh, the one person, and the other person, and there's just uh, very little emotion uh, uh, given. Uh, but uh, you it's know, it's not what obviously... you think of with Italians normally, is it? Oh, I, I wouldn't want to generalize, but uh, <laughs> you know, these two are obviously a strong team. You know, the, you can tell by the way they race and. Uh, and we're uh, still waiting here for 49er FX racing to begin. So I think we're going to go to uh, replay the third race from yesterday. And we can see that team jump back in. Two minutes 30 to go. And uh, we've still got good breeze. It's a little bit overcast compared with previous days. It was just amazing yesterday with the, uh, the sunshine and the heat. But I mean, this is still for kill. This is just a... A fantastic day on the water and we really enjoyed that last race let's see what the winning tactic off the start line is we saw di two different approaches to it Ben we saw um, Germany 77 win the pin or they didn't necessarily win the pin at the time of the start but 20 or 30 seconds in they were definitely the winning boat out of that side of the course meanwhile the Spanish go for this uh, port tax start underneath the fleet they know that they're going to be going underneath the, the, the sails of everyone else, taking some bad air early on. But what it does is it launches them out into clear air very quickly, possibly sooner than anybody else starting out towards the left-hand side on the more conventional starboard. So uh, we see Germany 77 on the right of picture lining up for another conventional start. Um, who, who would you rather be, those, those Spanish that seem to like that uh, port tax start or winning the pit? Winning the pin is, uh, is, is pretty powerful stuff, it's, uh, it, we, especially in these boats that uh, have multiple modes upwind where you can get into your, your fast BMG mode. Uh, the quickest of all is a, is a good one, but you can see there's a lot of boats vying for the pin this time. So uh, you've got to match uh, the, the power of winning the pin against your odds of getting it. And right now, like we've seen Paul Koloff and Alicia Stillhammer uh, uh, take the pin a couple times, but they've got plenty of competition uh, this time for that spot and they're... Uh, Wait, uh, and uh, well, I, I was going to say three Germans. One German's just bailed out. But we, those two Germans that were thrown out of the previous race for starting too soon, they're in amongst that front pack, so they're, they're still not holding back. You know, they're, they're, they're pushing this line. They've got 38 seconds to go, and um, they're already quite close up to the line. Yeah, this is uh, looking good for these Danish, actually. They've uh, got a good runway here with 27 seconds to go. So, oh, just let's see that if there's a German just sneaking in there, they, but they didn't go for the final spot in the in the lineup. So uh, Denmark 447, younger team, new team uh, lined up and, and looking to get off and rolling on this race uh, with France 085 just above them. Ten seconds to go and Sayuma Pedersen and Boris Goff from Denmark look like they're going to win the pin. Surely not the Swedish. Just draw your action to the, the port tackers. That looks very tight between the German and the Swedish there. So the Danes winning this end of the line, coming off the line beautifully in front of a French boat and a German boat, but already boats charging off to the right-hand side. So more people trying the, the Spanish tactic than we saw in the previous race. So that's becoming increasingly popular. But look at the gap that these young Danes have pulled on board Denmark's 447. That's uh, Natasha Violet, Saoma Pedersen and Matthias Brun Boriskov. Yeah, fantastic start from them. Uh, we saw them have a good race in the first race, and uh, they're well on target here. I mean, they've got a 20-meter lead on everyone uh, except the Zajac there uh, already, so uh, they'll be loving that start. Uh, we see on the far side of the course the Italians uh, doing well, so uh, 
we were a little bit worried that they might be hesitant, but uh, no, no, nothing showing so far. Oh, and I also, they the looked... Spanish have also gone far right. Yeah, so the Spanish doing it again. So they obviously enjoy what they get out of those port tax starts, and it's interesting to see the Italians follow suit because the Italians have tended to start on starboard. So a different approach for them, and I wonder if that injury um, is anything to do with their change in tactics. Does it take the pressure off Miley Frascari in some way? Wow, what a replay there. So many boats right on time on that line. So very impressive starting from the fleet. And I uh, just want to see... Now we're not able to see the port tech uh, starters. Uh, well, very briefly, you could through. see the Spanish just sailing behind the other boats. So, so the Spanish were definitely one of the, the, the fastest starters on port. But yes, we didn't quite see them break through. And uh, yeah, it'd be lovely to, to hold up on a, a, you know, a level uh, angle with the camera boat. But it's really difficult to keep up with these boats on the water, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, they're doing uh, 10, 11, 12 knots upwind. So uh, very quick. We can see middle of the line. Bizarro Frascari have already tacked back from their initial port tack start and uh, looking good in the middle of the fleet. Uh, they've got a, obviously a couple contenders on either side of them. Uh, Koloff and Stillhammer's just going through the bottom of the picture. They're not having their best start so far. No, not terrible, but but not in amongst the front runners. And uh, for all their form, I, I am amazed that Bissaro and Frascari are already up there vying for the lead. I mean, they seem to have been completely unshaken by what just happened in the previous race. Yeah, we've got actually uh, midline, far side, and this uh, near side all uh, basically right on the gain line. So a very even race so far with uh, quite a few boats in the mix. Uh, Zajek and Mats from Austria just... Uh... So uh, uh, Bissaro Frascari sailing across on starboard, but Pacheco and Trittle still out on the far right doing very well. You can see them right of picture and they look like they're in quite a high mode and yeah. Polgar and Werner on 369, the German boat, about to duck behind the Italians. Now, who's this on the left? Will they be able to get That's across Zajac the Italians? and Mats, as well as uh, Pedersen and Boriskov, uh, but also going to try and cross the Italians, and I think they're going to get across here. So the leaders are the ones who did get the good starts on starboard off the, off the start line, but uh, so far very close across the fleet. So it looks like the... Uh, Italians weren't able to get a piece of the Austrians or the young Danish, um, but yeah, it's, it's still an awful lot of boats to uh, uh, to in contention here. The Italians just going into attack there, just going on to the line. Pacheco and Triddle doing very well here, so uh, the right has come well for them, and the, they've been committed to that right side this whole day, and it often has done them well, but not necessarily put them into the lead, but here it does seem like they're into the lead. Uh, one boat extremely far to the right, Mully and Nemec, um, who are uh, you know quite far down the standings, but uh, obviously uh, having a good uh, go at the front of the race here. Uh, extreme right, along with Martinson and Mortensen. Monson and Mortensen, they tried to make the right work in the previous race. It, it looked good for a moment, but then it, it didn't come good in the end. Will they be able to make something of the right-hand side this time? This is an incredibly close race from left to right as we get up towards the top end. Nor normally, more of a pattern has emerged. Pacheco and Trittle going through a very smooth tack. Looks like Pacheco's got some kind of um, uh, GoPro on her helmet. Uh, maybe to uh, for a bit of self coaching, um, be able to replay that footage at the end of the day and work out what they can from the uh, the camera work that she's getting off the top of her protective helmet. Yeah, uh, Pacheco and Trito there rolling into the windward mark, so uh, looking very good here. And uh, they do have a couple boats pretty far leveraged onto the far side, but uh, should be able to hold their lane here as long as the angle and the wind uh, stays true. Well, Koloff and Stuhlhammer, uh, and we saw them you know, relatively far back uh, earlier in the race, and they've moved up into second place on the virtual, so uh, they're finding something on the, on the far right side there. But the Spanish an awful long way ahead from what we saw from that last shot just then. I don't know how they've suddenly managed to do that, but the Spanish seem to have found something really good on the left-hand side. We can't, can't see them there. Um, so um, anyway, 
Oh, so uh, we are coming up towards a start in the real world now. So sorry to have to break off from yesterday's coverage, um, and uh, we won't. Uh, we're, we're, we're spoiler free here, aren't we? So we're, we're not going to give away uh, what happened. And don't you dare look at the results to see what happened, because uh, that was that was a pretty nice race that we saw yesterday. Anyway, we're at one minute away, so I hope we get onto the water very soon to see how things are shaping up for the race about to uh, to come on. So a bit of a change of pace from yesterday we're about to see, um, Ben. So uh, it's, it's, it's nothing like as windy as it was yeah, yesterday. Yeah, this, uh, the this is the first Gold Fleet race of the 49er FX. We saw them, uh, they've had two days of qualifying between the two fleets, and these are the top half of the boats. And we saw them uh, start what, about 45 minutes ago, and it was abandoned halfway up the first beat just because it was so light. But here with uh, two minutes and 30 seconds to go until the start, we have, uh, you know, some wind there. You can see the, the large sails for stabilizer at the back of the committee boat there flapping gently, but not so gently that, uh, that, that we shouldn't get racing off. This looks like it'll be a good day, although uh, s slower than that NACA racing we were just watching, but that's okay. We've got uh, just in the foreground there, Andrew Lee Schutt, uh checking her transit in Denmark 49 along with the, the Canadian, the Llewellyn sisters. Most of the boats though stacked up at the pin end and probably already in their slots is uh, fighting for their, their lanes to start off the pin end. So I don't know if it's uh, pin favored right now. Uh, or, and, or why the fleet has bunched up at that end. But it is a very big start line, so there's plenty of room for everyone if they want to use it. So uh, do you think the Danes and the Canadians are asking themselves if they're in the, uh, the right part of the start right now? Because they haven't got a lot of company. Yeah, I mean, they, I know the Canadian girls, it's their first trip overseas, right? but Schutt is a very experienced campaigner. So um, maybe, maybe Schutt wants to attack right with her new crew, uh, even Nielsby, and, and just wants to get as far right as possible, or maybe they just want a, a really clear, clean start and don't want to have to deal with the fight. But uh, it is interesting that they're so far away from the pack. Well, are, uh, are two of these boats right and the rest of the fleet wrong? We'll find out in one minute's time. There's a U-flag flying. That's the red and white flag in the middle of the committee boat that just comes down at the one minute. That U-flag means you cannot afford to be over in this final minute before the start. If you are, you'll be disqualified. Just looking at the very f uh, farthest pin boat that we can see, they've got the Netherlands and the giant number one symbol on there. So that's our world champions, Annemiek Beckering and Annette Deutsch, uh, trying to win the pin at the far side. We can't see too many of the details from this far away. Uh, but I just thought I'd point that out. But there's a lot of boat over the, boats over there. The whole fleet's over on that side. So uh, Is someone going to fall foul of this U-flag? Because it looks so busy up there. Surely they're going to end up driving each other over. Well, and it does look like it is pin end favor. Looking at the way that these boats are lining up, it seems like there's quite a lot of advantage that the boats down this end of the line are prepared to give away for a clearer start with, with more clear air around them. Ten seconds to go. Boats accelerating, and it's a very, very pin bias line. So much so that some boats are out onto port tack already. A couple boats tacked over onto port, and uh, and it looks like a lot of the fleet has started on port with last minute tacks. So, and you can see how much farther ahead they are than these boats that have started at the boat end. We've got uh, oh, it's a general recall, Andy. We can see that in the foreground. So that's the uh, red and or the <laughs> yellow and blue triangle flag there. So we're going to get to do that all over again uh, with the U flag. That means you're just qualified if the race goes forward but doesn't carry over to the next race so everyone will get another chance to start here and I would suggest that the race officer should probably move that pin boat down a little bit to get a fair square line because if everyone could tack and cross that quickly uh, it was always going to be trouble. Well you expect very very good race organization at Kiel Week so I can't help thinking that that must have happened quite late on in the piece I mean I know we saw a, a lot of the fleet already up there um, but I don't think that uh, a Kiel Week race committee would set up a pin against uh, set up a line against the breeze in that way knowingly doing so uh, there must have been a late shift well we, the, when we came on with 230 and the fleet knew the fleet was up there the whole time okay. so uh, you would have abandoned it earlier would you i i, I don't know what i would have done but uh, I, I do you know you can see how how uh, biased that end was with the uh, people basically crossing this end uh, right away so that was never going to work for a fleet lovely start for sweden 22 if it had worked out that would have been vilma bobek and malentendstrom 
the uh, the young contenders from Sweden who probably would five boat lengths over the line. Yeah, that's the thing. Like that's that, the but, thing. Uh, it doesn't matter. We don't know when we start again. Five minutes thirty. So I don't think it, with such a quick turnaround the they would have been able to move the pin boat. So um, maybe maybe it is shifty, or maybe the uh, race officer is going to put up his black flag and, and tell the fleet to behave. Are you allowed to move the, the pin mark um, after the four-minute gun has fired? After? No, no. So up, they can move it until four minutes, though. Okay. So could they have two different boats anchored, and they could just move the flag from, from one boat to another? Uh, yes, they, they could do it. It is the flag that matters, but I, I don't. I don't think many race officers carry a spare boat, so, uh, <laughs> so I don't think that's what will have happened, but um, we'll see how it fleets out. I mean, they, they could also have just driven in reverse very quickly and pulled their anchors and, uh, and gotten reset, uh, so we'll find out shortly, see how the fleet sets up. Yes. There's our world champions, Annemiek Beckering and Annette Deutsch. Um, I'm sorry, I think that's the yellow jerseys of oh, sorry, yes. uh, Victoria Jotstock and Annika Lawrence. So they're, they're Germans, and uh, they, they've had their moments at the front of the fleet, but not lately, Ben. So for them to be leading this regatta, that's a bit of a turn up for the books for your Sock and Lawrence in 2019, isn't it? It is, yeah. They, uh, they had the best season of any team in 2017 and uh, you know, trained hard after the Olympics. Um, and, uh, and we're looking great in 2017, but uh, you know, quite frankly, their form in both 2018 and 2019 so far has been below the, the standard they set for themselves. But uh, we see they still have it. Uh, and it's probably a bit of a sign of the overall depth of the fleet that uh, that uh, you know a team that's down in the in the teens uh, for some of the regattas can also be out in front and uh, also a bit of a diminutive pair like well certainly not the biggest pair by, by far in these two windy days of 20 knots and uh, they flourished uh, they've haven't had a race worse than fourth overall yet and have a 17 point lead on second place oh look at the color of that flag uh, race officer said you listen up the fleet uh, stay behind the line i don't care what this angle is so a black flag, not that different to the red and white U flag that was flying earlier, but it means that if there are any general recalls, if you're over the line, it doesn't matter from now on, you're out of this race. Whereas the, the red and white U flag, if you start over the line and then there is a general recall, as we've just seen, then those naughty girls that were over the line early get a reprieve and they get a chance to come back into this race. So the, the U flag is tending to be used a lot more than the black flag these days, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, I mean, basically the Olympic fleets have given up on using uh, the Blue Peter, the regular start flag, and the I flag, which was deemed as unfair to some boats uh, over others based on where they were on the line because the penalty wasn't equal. So the I flag fell out of favor, the one where you have to exonerate yourself by going around the end of either side, uh, and now it's U flag, which means if you're over on the start, uh, you're disqualified. Um, but if there's a general recall, you can restart. And, and then, of course, the black flag, which has uh, been around a long time, uh, which means you may not be over. Right. And uh, I'm sure the, the, the race off has reset the line, though. Hasn't he, Ben? Or has he? No, I don't do not think <laughs> that the line has been reset. I think the fleet is, uh, has detected there's a favored side and is now going to work hard to exploit it. This is probably the toughest start uh, to execute unless the fleet is quite experienced. So an experienced fleet, they'll all line up on starboard and they'll all basically tack simultaneously at go and get and cross the line on port because it's very difficult to cross the line on uh, when it's so favored on starboard. Uh, and, the, and it works fine, actually. The, the trouble you get is if there's half of an experienced fleet and half of an inexperienced fleet and the inexperienced ones uh, just want to hold starboard because that's what they're used to <laughs> and the experienced want to tack over and get going and get across the line and start the race that way. So uh, we'll see just how well the fleet fares here, but uh, I would expect, since this is a gold fleet, they, they've got a chance to pull this off and get clean racing, which is, of course, all everyone really wants. So uh, it looks like... It, interestingly, just at the boat end here, we do not see the two teams no. to, and the Canadians who, who thought they'd uh, take a clear lane. They've, they've decided it's worth the fight and, uh, and have moved up the line this time. And strangely, we see two Italian boats down here this time. Um, including Carlotta Armari and Matilda Di Stefano, the nearest boat to the committee boat, who so, did so well. They nearly won Genoa a couple of months ago in very light winds. If I had to speculate, I'd say those two fought it out at the bunch at the pin last time and didn't like it. And, <laughs> and they're, they're now here looking for the, the easy run to, across the line. But, uh, you, you know, we'll see just how favored that pin side is. It looks, you know, quite favored, doesn't it? Uh, it does. I mean, I, I would say that the Italians are not going to win the race from here, but they're probably not going to finish last either. Um, they're, they're, not everyone is going to be able to get a decent start out of the favoured end, up the top end of picture. Certainly not. Uh, 
you know, th- these types of starts where it's crowded at one end uh, and, and side favored uh, do raise the importance of having a good start and, of course, uh, also raise the risk that you're going to have a poor one because there's just fewer fewer lanes and, and narrower lanes and, and more action. So I quite fancy coming out the middle of the line on Port Tack, below all the melee, and just launching out to Port Tack, knowing that you've given away a bit of distance to those that do win the pin end, but it probably only three or four boats are going to come out decently out of the pin end. Yeah, We've got 10 you seconds can see a bunch of out. teams doing that now. So there are a bunch of teams on port just going behind everyone, and let's see what happens to the fleet. Four seconds to go, and the two Italians having the easiest possible start at this end of the line, but the real action is going on at the far end, and, and as Ben said, a bunch of boats already launched onto Port Tack, and we will find out very shortly who those boats are, the nearest Italian tacking as well, and uh, already given up an awful lot of distance on anybody. It looks incredibly messy up there with a lot of teams looking like they're hardly moving still. Obviously the teams that have flipped over and are on port looking like they're doing okay, but it doesn't look like very many teams at all have done are doing well on starboard. Hard to tell from this far away, but... Uh... Who is that that punched through? There's, uh... I think it's a Swedish boat um, okay, that's yeah. looking really... I wonder if it's Bobek again. So a Swedish boat right of picture, just going behind that German It is style, 22, 501. so that's Bobek and, and Tenstrom. So that, that's a repeat of what they did in the recalled race. So they've obviously got a winning strategy down, and, and they're looking really strong where they are. Also, Poland 888 on the left of picture. Melzaka looking strong. Yeah, and, and the breeze is so up I, here. I hear we... We... Sorry, I hear we have some boats over the line. I'm, I'm just trying to hear how many boats were over the line. Okay, we're waiting to find out how many... Oh, hang on. Is that the Swedish? Yeah, but they've just... It, it's a wind shift, so it's not... Uh, they, they basically sailed into a lull. They were double wow. trapping. I was just about to comment on that, in fact, it's windier. And now they've come to a dead stop. So that fantastic start, uh, I think they... Okay, back on the graphics, we can see... Uh, just. Whoa, that, so that was a very bad tea bag by Bobek and Tankstrom there. Yeah, it must have been a very abrupt uh, lull that they got into. And I, look how look how even it is actually. There's an awful lot of boats that have uh, come in here, and uh, we can see that we've got Italy 80 and Czech 138 both uh, confirmed as black flag started, so they uh, will not score here. Ooh. Okay, so so not not too many casualties, and, and and not any of the big names as far as we know. So that's Ottavia and Germani, Italy 80, and uh, the Czech team actually has done really well so far. Uh, uh, Vedurova and Tadenkova have had a great uh, start to this regatta, but uh, just facing some some tougher. Uh... Okay, so two boats out, Italy and the Czechs, but these Italians who made a very conservative start, Amari and Di Stefano, um, making their way out to the right hand side, hoping for a huge shift, which if they got would suddenly launch them into the lead. Um, they don't look too bad out here, actually. I'm just trying to pick up on uh, Bobek and Tenstrom. So they, Bobek and Tenstrom lost like 10 boat lengths in that one, uh, I, I assume, boat handling mishap. But my goodness, uh, that often expensive. you see someone going in a straight line and then completely uh, uh, teabagging themselves so badly that they, uh, it takes a long to recover. But uh, I guess they have. So well, It looks tropical conditions. Look at that beach at the back. I mean, who would know that you're at Kiel? Normally it's raining this time of year in Kiel. But the Italians... Peak tat for Carlotta Amari on the helm. Di Stefano just adjusting some controls, leaning in. And this is not the Italians that were over early, so uh, they'll be happy with how they're sailing so far. Look at how much they're having to move. So it's very, very up and down here in the breeze. You can see both sa both sailors moving uh, very frequently to keep that boat steady, and that's probably what caught the Swedes off guard here as they head in for attack. The, you know, the course probably isn't very big, so it could be ley line already. Yeah, they're up on their ley line, so uh, heading into the windward mark. So they made a very conservative start. They know they weren't over the line. That was the benefit. Th this isn't the leaders we're looking at. So the, the camera boat now is uh, heading upwind towards the front of the pack. And uh, we're going to see a German team of Froman and Froman probably next, uh, who are closer to the lead. But it looks like it's uh, Ninchevic and Domicheli Vichuri from Croatia that are holding the lead. We haven't actually seen a shot of them yet, but uh, 
not not a typical name to see at the front of a 49er FX Gold Fleet race, uh, but the Croatians having their moment in the sun. They've tacked onto the ley line. Doesn't look like anyone is going to overtake the Croatians. So, will these Croatians be able to hold on to the lead throughout this two-lap race? They've got experienced sailors like Ida Marie Bad Nielsen and Marie Thurskard Olsen and Jurtsok and Lawrence from Germany breathing down their necks. Remember, Jurtsok and Lawrence are leading this regatta. They're wearing the yellow jerseys and they've managed to get themselves out of that very difficult start into a decent third place. But it's Croatia about to go round in first place. Quite a lead there. They'll be thrilled with that lead so they can uh, go and set and uh, just go straight and, and get everyone else should pile up on the ley line here and hurt themselves whereas these two can sail away. So they'll be thrilled to have a big gap like that. Bad Nielsen and uh, Olsen here next around with their teammates uh, and Schutt and Nielsby uh, being pressured over top from Jersok and Lorenz. So this is where uh, some tighter battles are going to come in and uh, very a lot of pressure on these crews to get the spinnakers up and, and get lanes downwind. Let's see. I wouldn't imagine Jibe sits yet. There'd be too much bad air. Was that Lloyd Lutzenboik in fourth? Uh, no, no it's Froman the Froman. And, Froman. and that's Sweden 15, uh, Gross and Klinger. And there's the world champions from the Netherlands, Annemiek Beckering and Annette Dutz going around the outside of those four boats. And um, only now, 223 at the bottom of the picture, Italy 223, that's the boat we were tracking earlier, those young Italians. So going up the right hand side. And we side. still haven't seen Boba Contenstrom. So, the, oh, they're just coming in late on port. So they dropped from uh, almost well, a leading position. to the lead to, to, to 20th. My goodness. So very tangled up now. We can see a jibe setter getting stuck in with a boat that's late on port. So but neither boat can now go anywhere they want to. The, I'm talking about the British luffing up on the Swedish and the two teams just basically in a tangle, stuck. One wanting to go down when the other still wanting to go upwind. Why do they love the jibe set so much? I mean, I don't understand it working for one or two, but suddenly everyone's jibe setting. And it, you just think when everyone's jibe setting, surely the straight set is the thing to do. I wonder if they've seen a, a, a notch of breeze that we can't see in picture here that's suddenly going to launch them down the track. Yeah, some, uh, some tougher sailing in the back here. That's uh, uh, Canada looks like they might have hit that mark. Are they going to take a turn? I couldn't really see if they did hit the mark. Oh, is that the place to take your penalty turn? This is their first international regatta, so uh, showing us how not to do an, a top win mark rounding there, but I don't suppose anyone will protest them for being in the way uh, this late, but that was uh, Henkin and Tobias, actually. The USA entry was uh, also very deep here. So tough going at uh, in such light racing, uh, but the teams get off, and all the teams are around now. So a very busy win with Mark for some of the boats there. I'm interested to see if the Czechs can uh, can hold the lead they had because they... they uh, the Croatians. Sorry, the Croatians, yeah, because they did have a very nice lead and uh, we don't see them often at the front. So uh, we'll see if they've got the pace to hold on in the light winds. And they, they're, you know, being challenged on both sides, but still in good position so far. But Nielsen and Olsen, if they've got the ley line right, uh, could be looking pretty good there. But good sailing from Ninovic and Vituri. Well, the boat speed suggests that Nielsen and Olsen have a click of pace on everybody else. The massively different boat speed. And you can see how low they are, so that'll be pressure. Um, they, they're, they're 10 degrees lower than uh, the Croatians right now. So I'd say that's a lead change here to Nielsen and Olsen, uh, who held on the longest and have taken the low line. And I think they're going to be on ley line as well. So just one jibe for them. Um, and they'll jump into the lead. That, so just uh, seeing a replay of how not to do your penalty turn when you've hit the windward mark. Uh, the Canadians managed to thread their way through the boats coming straight towards them. Nielsen and Olsen in ninth overall right now, uh, 58 points back. So a good race here, uh, followed by a couple more, could them put them back in contention for this, uh, for this, for the podium at least. So both so, the both the final two teams did 360s by hitting the mark at the end. So not a good <laughs> way to try and recover. Just uh, coming into the lured marks here. This is the Croatians. Um, they were leading, but it looks like, as you just said, Ben, uh, the Danes have managed to find a better bit of breeze on the far side of the course, and that's quite a gain that the Danes have made in Denmark 7. Yeah, good sailing from them. So they've gone, they've, they found the breeze on that side of the course, and they're going straight back to it. They're, they're not uh, sailing straight and, and going the other way. They're going back to where the breeze was, and uh, that looks... That's a pretty solid strategy right there, although it, it is very light again now, so that breeze they found on the downwind may have already left. And Eden Nielsen only just moving up to the edge of the 
wings. She's been good, sitting in the Good sailing the from the Croatians, though. They, they did get passed by one boat, but they kept their lead on everyone else. So uh, pretty solid stuff. Schutt and Niels be here, Denmark 49. Let's see if they're going to sail all the way across. Uh, no, they're going to go to the close mark. So a split from them, and actually there's a bunch of boats just up above them that are about to come into the leeward mark. So. Italy 629, Bogomo and Sino going round the far mark. Germany 55, our series leaders, local sailors, Victoria Jurtzok and Annika Lawrence wearing the yellow jersey, getting that black Jenica down. Jurtzok out on the trapeze. Coming round this mark, Yamazaki and Takano from Japan. Followed by Germany 501, that's the Froman sisters. And Amari and Di Stefano, they've had a really good game. 2-2-3. Two, two, they were back in about 15th, 16th. They've, they've had a huge game. Now look how busy it gets. Wow, yeah. You wouldn't want to be the last one into this bit. And actually, speaking of the last ones into this fight, our Annemiek Beckering and Annette Deutsch are world champions with the Netherlands one in the middle on the outside of a pinwheel and having loads of boats coming in inside them. So they are losing a lot of positions right now at just about the worst time you can because actually if they jived over to this side, you can see that most of the team's able to sail through and keep their momentum. Uh, so Surprising to see the, the Dutch putting themselves in a, such a bad position tactically. I mean, there must have been better ways into that at the bottom of that gate and you see the Americans USA 92 that looks like they've made quite a gain down there yeah they've they've certainly caught up a lot uh, distance, from where they anyway. rounded distance anyways in, in a position where they can actually threaten but uh, and Anna Becker again and at Deutsch looks like they lost about seven boats at that lured mark rounding so even the world champions can make mistakes around those busy lured gates meanwhile out in front Bad Nielsen and Marie Olsen out in the lead, being chased by the early leaders of this race from Croatia, Ninchevic and Michele Vicuri. Names we don't normally speak about very much, so they're having a fantastic race. And out on this side, Schutt Nielsby. They've come quite a long way, but they've just gone into attack. So the Danes tacking over towards the leaders, over towards the left. And that is Schutt Nielsby. And they've got a reasonable breeze here, actually. Both sailors now on the wing, semi-trapezing. Got the jib quite loose, sailing the sails quite free, trying to keep the boat punchy and powered up through this sloppy chop. There's not a lot of wind, so you need to make the most of the power that you can get out of those sails, keeping them full, keeping them deep. Now, should Niels be on the right-hand side being able to make any kind of gains on their fellow Danes on the left-hand side? Well, Bud Nielsen and Olsen already up close to that ley line, so this is a very, very short course, understandably so, because there isn't a lot of wind, and we've got a target time for these two lap races of 30 minutes. So uh, it's surprising to see that Ninchevich and uh, Michele Vaturi haven't yet tacked. They are just tacking as I speak, but they, they must be quite high up on that ley line, not giving them an themselves an awful lot of choice about what they do from now on. But the Croatians look like they got good breeze up on that side. Yeah, they do. They're uh, sailing a good race, uh, never really putting themselves under pressure, taking that first beat lead and, and sailing in clear air the whole time. They, you know, they they didn't sail quite to the ley line like uh, like Bad Nielsen and Olsen did to, to, to win the lead, but uh, very consistent sailing from them otherwise, and in a, in a position where they can attack from here. But tactically, in a safer, more conservative kind of place are the leaders, Bad Nielsen and Duskard Olsen from Denmark, and they've been one of the mainstays of 49er FX racing since the very early days, haven't they, Ben? I mean, yeah, I, they, I thought for a while they would be going to, to uh, the Rio 2016 games for, for Denmark, but it, it turned out not to be in the end. Yeah, they won the 2013 and 2014 European Championships, so uh, certainly uh, one of the on-form teams and a, and a medal at the World Championship as well. So they were uh, 
early leaders, but ultimately uh, Jenna Hansen and, Sas- and uh, Saskia Iverson took the uh, titles at the end of the quad when it mattered and got the Olympic berth and ultimately a bronze medal. So I know they were incredibly proud of uh, the squad work they did and, and uh, have a feeling like they, they earned part of that bronze medal for their nation. But uh, this time they're, they're continuing on, both still young sailors and, and able to try and earn the glory themselves. Yeah, um, Jenna Hansen has, has dropped out. She's retired and seems, we saw her a couple of nights ago outside a restaurant. She seems very happy with her life. She did the Volvo Ocean Race. I thought maybe she'd come back for another go around of the uh, the Olympic. Well, she game, did. But... She jumped in and won the world championship, but then decided uh, she would go into coaching. I mean, so she's still on circuit, but uh, decided her body was ready to play the game from the coach boat instead of from the water so we got Nielsen and Olsen here just coming up on their ley line one last quick look over their shoulders to uh, check how close it's all going to be before they roll into their tack uh, and around this mark what we expect to be in first place if they can pull off their tack successfully well it's all a little bit more gentle than the NACRA racing that we saw yesterday this is um, sailing and have played at a different speed today more of a chess game into the tack yeah, very careful steps, all about flow and not disturbing the boat and then getting back up to speed. So, yeah, very different from the windy racing we've seen so far in this regatta. Uh, but the races all count equally, so you've got to be able to perform in all of it, which is a, a good even test for the fleet here in Kiel this year. And that number one on the sail at the back of picture, that's Annemiek Becker and Annette Dutz. They're not making many inroads into this race right now. Yeah, this is going to be pretty close Ooh. with the Croatians here. Uh, yeah. They... You know, the, the, the Danes did make their pass by being farther left, so m- maybe there is just a touch more wind, although the Croatians get a set of waves uh, that are pretty big right at the moment they wouldn't want to, but I think they're going to be ahead here. It, you know, the tacks do take a while at this wind strength, so they'll probably sit, I would imagine, slightly on top of the Danes so they don't get in any trouble. Oh, I think they got a bit far there, haven't they? Yeah, I mean... Am I looking at the wrong bar? I might no, the, no the, it's the one with the black band. Oh, so, come uh, on. Surely they, they, they've let the Danes off the hook, haven't they? We'll see if the Danes can make it. Maybe the Danes are, are already pressing high, and, and we saw them look over their shoulders a few times. And uh, I think... Uh, yeah, fair enough. I take it back. I mean, the Danes are struggling. and maybe I don't not... think they're going to make it. I think they've got two more tacks left. So Croatians here have taken the, the lead, and actually they've done the right things, and, and they're going to have a solid lead here as they head down the final uh, run to this race. So yeah. way to snatch uh, the lead back there, and we see, we'll see see a hoist, and I imagine a straight set with the pressure on that side. So uh, Absolutely. All the gains have been made on this side, upwind and downwind, so surely the Croatians will sail quite deep into that corner this time round. Yeah, and still nothing disastrous from Nielsen and Olsen, so uh, they went up a little more up the middle of the beat, and, uh, you know, they've lost one place, but still ahead of their teammates here, uh, Schutt and Isben Nielsby. Nice set from the Danes as they settle in to their uh, downwind roll. So it's the help doing the work on the wing, and the crew sitting in playing the Jenica from down by the mast. Yeah, blue, red, blue, black, and red spinnakers all in a straight line here as uh, the fleet's in pretty much agreement that uh, staying straight is the way to go. Japanese Yamazaki and Takano going round in fourth place. Good Dark gains from Jenica. them. Good gains from them, so that's a very good race. And Yotsuk and Lawrence in sixth. They were doing better than that. I think they were in third at one point earlier on in the race, down in seventh actually. So. Some losses for Yurtsuk and Lawrence, uh, but maybe still leading overall in the overall standings. We'll find out when this race is over. Yeah. Bo- Bogomo and Sino from Italy. This is a newer pair. Uh, the Belgian pair just coming in just ahead of Versa- Ver- Jersok and Lorenz tacking. So these two uh, were actually a part of two NACRA teams from Belgium last year. Uh, both the helm or both the male partners decided to stop sailing. So these two teamed up and jumped in an FX, which is kind of the model of the three fleets working anyways. So uh, increases your odds of finding one you can sail with if you have a choice of either sex. And, uh, you know, obviously early days in their 49er FX careers, and they're both quite young. I think they're both teenagers still, but uh, good sailing from them. Nice bit of product placement there as well, Ben, manager of the 49er FX and NACRA classes. And uh, the Germans leading this regatta with the yellow jerseys. They're the first to do the jibe set. Good, uh, good beat there from Sweden 999, uh, Wester and Nestler. Uh, they gained a couple places and are now in an attacking position as opposed to a defensive position where they uh, 
they were behind or just holding off a pack earlier, so now they can see if they can find a few gains. I'm a little surprised we, I can see in the virtual that uh, should Nielsby and uh, the Japanese team of Yamako and Tomato, uh, Tomaka, Tamaza, Takano have, uh, have jived off. So there's a little bit of risk now uh, happening at the front of the pack as teams try and uh, sort out which is the fastest way downwind on this final lap. Well, Yosuke and Lawrence were the first to jibe off onto that side, and they don't always have the benefit of seeing what we've seen, Ben. We, we saw the power of sailing, doing the straight set and carrying on into that corner because that's how Nielsen and Olsen from Denmark took the lead in the first run. Um, and actually, looking at the virtual, look at the difference in track. Look at the Croatians and the angle they're doing. Look at the angle of Shut Nilsby and Yamazaki and Takano from Japan. That's exactly what we saw in the previous run. You've got to get over into that left-hand corner as we as we look at it on our screen now. It seems like the angles down here are oh, so much better. And Nielsen and Olsen uh, have gone as far into this corner as they can, so uh, they're doing trying to do the exact same thing they did on the first lap uh, by passing everyone on the extreme far side of our picture at this point. Uh, but, you know, for this stage of the race, I'm very surprised uh, that the leaders haven't had any agreement on the best way downwind here, because you'd think at this stage that they'd have picked up on something, but we've got uh, the top four in basically all three options on the race course. Well, and looking at our leaders now, they look pretty soft there. I mean, that, that's not exactly comfortable, but maybe it's still the best of what's out there. Well, we saw when Nielsen and Niels, when Nielsen and Olsen were really low, they were fast. And uh, we see right now Ninovic and Vittori are low but slow. So it isn't pressure that's brought them this low. It's their sailing style right now. They're obviously sailing a very low style, uh, which could work out, but it's not the same as when uh, Nielsen and Olsen made the big pass on them in the last leg. Well, they got boats both sides of them, so this is a very difficult race for Ninchevich and to Michele Vittori to be able to defend. It does look good here that they're uh, well ahead of the boats that jibed early, so that hasn't worked and, and doesn't spell uh, very well for our overall leaders, Jersok and Lorenz. Uh, but possibly we can see the, the just see the black kite top of top of the middle of the picture, uh, who's now the big threat for the Croatians. And doing the best boat speed out there, doing just over eight knots just now. So slightly faster speeds for the Danes on the far side. But as you say, Ben, maybe the Croatians in the lead are just heading a bit deeper and soaking down, not pushing the Jenica quite so hard, trying to sail shorter distance and, and lower speed. I'm a bit surprised now that they've covered uh, the teams that came to the closer side here that they don't jibe right now, uh, get straight ahead of the Danes, and, and then there'd be no options left. But maybe they're just so close to the finish that they feel they don't need to but um, certainly the conservative mood would be to put in two jibes here and, and just eliminate all the separation but uh, they're just they're just going to hold straight and you know often when it's this light you just want to do anything you can to keep flow so maybe they just don't want to interrupt that yes it well, could they, be close they... though still you know if they have if they don't pull off a great jibe um, I mean they should have it going into that jibe now this should be their final jibe and now, once they've got the boat going, a nice jump out on the trapeze by the helm, by Ninchevic, building up the speed. And you can see the Black Jenica coming down. Is this going to be enough for Croatia to take the win? This is going to be a fantastic result for Croatia. 1-1-2. One, one, Holding their nerve, Ninchevic and the Michele Vituri winning the first race of the Gold Fleet in the 49er FX at Kiel Week. And in the end quite comfortably ahead of those Danes. Denmark 7, who did take the lead briefly, but then gave it back up to the Croatians. Denmark 7, Eden Marie Nilsson and Marie Olsen crossing the line for second place. Very good race for them. They'll be happy with that. These uh, extremely light air races are, are always like uh, landmines. You know, you, you never know when you might hit a bad one. Uh, so any any time you get a top five, top ten result, and when it's this light, uh, a bit of relief. And I think we're going to see next end through the line is uh, Yamazaki and Takano, who will have passed Schutt and Nielsen and Nielsby for uh, third place here. So. So here's the moment for third and fourth place. Will the Japanese on the far side with the blue spinnaker be able to cross just in front? They dive down for the line. The Japanese do claim third place across the line ahead of Denmark 49, Schutt and Nilsby. 
But as you were just saying, Ben, um, any result in the top 10 in these kind of conditions you'd take, you'd be very happy with that. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, this this lets all these teams who have decent races stay in the hunt for the championship. Uh, we saw, you know, Animake Beckering there. We don't actually even see her on the on the leaderboard here. So our, she's in second place overall heading into this uh, and now having a deep race. So here we go. Jersock and Lorenz, uh, we saw them jibe set. So they have made a couple passes on this downwind. Good They've sailing done very from well. Ben. Done very well. So they, they are currently... Haven't got the batons popped there. Okay, yeah. They're not quite done yet. So get some batons across and... Uh, oof. Oh, it's not comfortable, is it? No, but it uh, doesn't look comfortable for anyone else either, so they'll be okay. <laughs> well, are they in danger of being rolled by the Italians? No, the Germany 55, our series leaders, get fifth place across the finish line, just ahead of the Italians, Bogomo and Sino, and just behind them are the German Froman sisters. So we haven't seen uh, third, fourth, second, third, and fourth place yet, which are Netherlands 1, uh, Beckering and Deutsch, Sweden 22, Bogebeck and Tenstrom, and Germany 29, Lutz and Boyka. Those teams are all, you know, having bad races here, and, and they've, they're all in contention for the overall championship. So well, that basically means that the boat we were just looking at, the wearing the yellow jerseys is going to be even further ahead on the points. That's right, and and the second, third, and fourth uh, are threatened here by Denmark 49, so they've already actually been passed uh, on the leaderboard by Denmark 49, who, who's moved into second place based on that result. Bunch of boats finishing here. A Dutch boat, but it's not the one you're looking for, Ben. No, and uh, and neither is that Swedish boat. The so here we go, Germany 29, that's Lutz and Boyka, just about to get to the finish line next, but that's down in, it's got to be 14th or so place by now, so uh, tough race from Lutz Boyka, our 2017 European champions when we were here in Kiel. Let's see if we can find uh, our world championships, Beckering and Deutsch, yeah, still don't see them. I mean, there's a chance they were in that, I don't think so, I think we would have spotted them. There's Henken and Tobias from the USA. USA 92 coming in across the line on starboard. But just uh, just looking across uh, Brickwood from the UK. And then she does. So a uh, bit of a catch up there for the Americans. Right hand of picture is the number one on the Dutch sail. That's Beckering and Dutz way, way, way at the back. There's and here's uh, Bobek and Tenstrom. So second, third, and fourth place, all having terrible races here uh, in this light winds. And it's going to be, oh, I, I think I called like Bobek, Bobek and Tenstrom there. So yeah. even Beckering and Dutz even lost another place at the very last minute. So uh, that was, you know, that we saw them have that terrible mark, lured mark rounding. They could have gone to the other mark and given up something, but in the end, they they didn't. They got stuck in on the side they wanted to go, and, and it hasn't paid off at all as... Uh, as, uh, I think we've uh, got word here that we're going to have another 49er FX race after this, followed by two 49er races. So a bit more, as the winds seems to be filling in, I'd say, based on how the afternoon's going, we're going to have a bit more late night racing here in Kiel. Yeah, I think it might well be late night racing. And uh, so we're just about getting to the back markers, and the last boat across the line from Italy is Wank and Bertuzzi. Last boat across the finish line and some pretty big gaps there. Okay, so while we're waiting um, for that next FX race to get underway, we're going to see if we can get another interview in. And so Pete Burling. Thank you very much for joining. So uh, you've already been out there on the Kieler Förde. Describe us your performance, your overall number one right now and uh, how the weather conditions were. Yeah, you know, it's been a really nice qualifying here for the, the 49ers in Kiel Week. It's been uh, you know, really warm, you know, relatively windy offshore breezes. Um, yeah, so I blew myself had a solid start, but it uh, looks a little different today. Um, you know, very light wind, quite overcast, so uh, it's going to be a tricky one. Yeah, light winds today, so how are you going to deal with that? It's totally different than yesterday. Yeah, I think the biggest factor as well is that we're going into goal fleet racing now, so all the top boats are in one fleet, so that's the real change. Uh, we'll have to see what the conditions are when we get out there, and, and we'll assess it as we go, but uh, looking forward to getting into the, the business end of the regatta. So you won the Kiel Week already, uh, Olympic gold, uh, America's Cup winner, so uh, how is that? You are the guy who has to be beaten. Is the pressure on you or on the guys who challenge you? I think, you know, we just got to concentrate on doing what we can do and sailing the boat well. Um, you know, we've been enjoying getting back in the 49er. It's been a fun year so far. 
uh, yeah, but it was nice to win the last regatta we did, and we were looking to win this one again. What about you? Yeah, you know, we um, always like to lead from the front, and uh, you know, we're just really enjoying you know being back in the 49er. Obviously, we had a couple of years off when we we're doing the, the America's Cup and, and the Volvo Ocean Race, so now it's just good to be uh, you know getting back close to the front of the fleet again. Yeah, so you won all, you won almost everything. What still keeps you motivated to go out in the water and perform like that? <laughs> well, I think it's just good fun. You know, it's um, yeah, really cool to be able to go out and sail small boats uh, for your country, and you know, for Blair and myself, you know, we've got that, that drive to drive to go and try and get a another gold medal for our, our country in um, Tokyo. So you know, all these events are on the road to to that that goal. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Blair. All the best for that. Great to see uh, Merling and Chuk back here at Kielabuka. They won here before, um, but the last time they won, they hadn't won everything else that they'd done in their careers. I mean, they, they've won pretty much everything there is to win in sailing, and they haven't even turned 30. Uh, but they seem to be loving their 49er sailing as much as ever. It, 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 it would be so easy to uh, for them to just sort of carry on in the, the America's Cup world, go on the super yacht racing circuit, earn squillions a day. Um, but they're back trying to win another gold medal for New Zealand and the way they're sailing, leading here in Kiel Week. They won the European Championships a month or so back in Weymouth. They're getting back to top form frighteningly quickly. Yeah, they've they've really uh, committed hard to the 49er sailing this year, uh, doing every uh, regatta on the circuit and even some that uh, you know many of the teams didn't do. So uh, they you know they clearly have their focus on the 49er right now. You know they they're you know on the team New Zealand America's Cup boat, but there's not a lot of America's Cup racing for them to do right now. And uh, I think we probably would have seen them in Sail GP had uh, the politics not uh, prohibited it. So you know. They have to do some racing to keep sharp, and, and I think that was actually one of the the main keys for the New Zealand victory is they got guys right at the top of the sailing game to, to steer the America's Cup yacht last time and, and take the win, and now they're going to get a chance to repeat it and see how they do. Well, they're probably quite relieved that they uh, have got this 49er racing to do, because from what I hear, um, we're, well, we're certainly not going to see any World Cup um, uh, America's Cup World Series racing going on this year. We were meant to have some events this year. I'm hearing we may not get anything next year. It may be that we go into the America's Cup in Auckland 2021 without actually having seen these AC75s race at all. And uh, some, of the, some of the boats, some of the teams won't have got much racing under their belts. At least the Kiwis will have done. So uh, we have the, uh, the analytics up on screen. And uh, so Ninchevich and the Michele Brituri, well, they, they had a standout race and a very good top speed. We saw them sailing very low on that downwind, and I think that what we're seeing is their distance sails, four or five, uh, almost 200 meters less than their compa than uh, at least Ben Nielsen and Olsen. So, um, you know, I think they, they sailed a low air uh, distance downwind, kept the flow going, and were able to pull it off, uh, but also decent speeds at other times uh, as a high speed. So a pretty good combo for a win. What else do we notice in this table? Your suck on the rents, 13 maneuvers compared to only eight. So uh, not five. that expensive in those conditions, though, are they maneuvers? I mean, if you can get back up to speed uh, consistently. So if you've got a good feel for the flow, yeah, the maneuvers don't have to be super expensive. And uh, and obviously, your suck and Lorenz uh, did a few uh, to to come back. You know, we thought they were a bit under threat uh, as uh, uh, halfway through the race, but they actually ended up with quite a solid result, and uh, and have extended their overall lead here uh, to from 17 points. Uh, to, sorry, their, their overall lead is now eight points uh, over Schutt and Nielsby, who uh, beat them just by one point in the last race. But the big news on the leaderboard is that uh, Beckering and Deutsch have dropped all the way down to eighth. Well, just uh, read out their scores in this regatta, Beckering and Deutsch. Yeah, so they started with a 1-2-1-1 one, 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 uh, so uh, over the first four races, and then a, now a 19-10-23. Uh, so on a series of, of poor races, they've got to be disappointed after starting so well to have... Uh, uh, basically fallen off uh, the edge here. I wonder if they capsized in that race of the 19th uh, yesterday. And, uh, you, you wouldn't think there'd be 18 teams uh, that stayed upright much slower than the, the Breeze, so I, yeah. I expect that was a capsized race. Uh, and then a 10th, that could have been anything, uh, and now a 23rd in this race, that's that's too bad. And here's that overall leader table as we see Schutz and Nielsby um, were able to advance uh, ahead of three boats. They moved up from 5th uh, to 2nd based on the strength of that race, and, and we see Bobit and Tenstrom uh, 
taking advantage of, well, of having a low drop so far, so only scoring 11 after their 22nd in that race we just saw. Uh, likewise, Lutz Boyka being able to drop the most recent race and uh, and still a few points back. So, Dursak and Lorenz and Shut Nilsby have got to be look, uh, pretty happy right now, but these light races, anything can happen. Yeah, well, we got about four minutes to the start of the next 49er FX race. Uh, will we see another surprise winner? I hope that the Croatians won't uh, take offence at me call it, calling them a surprise winner. Ninchevic and uh, the Micheli Vituri, they had a fantastic race. They held their nerve and they managed to regain the late lead from the Danes. That, Just uh, taking a look at their scoreline, actually, them. they started with a 20th in the regatta, but since then have had uh, 12 7 6, 10 4 1. So pretty consistent sailing from a relatively new team. They've got a very experienced uh, Croatian coach who I raced against here. So uh, uh, Peter Kupak uh, is uh, leading them uh, towards the next generation of Croatian sailing. So that's nice to see. So they've got some good advice. Uh, and uh, and with enough practice, I think they are a young team. So uh, maybe we're seeing new contenders emerge, or, or at least have a chance. It's a little early to say emerge. Those other contenders from Sweden, Vilma Bobek and Malin Tengström, where well, they had a fantastic start on that really difficult to execute start off a heavily biased pin end line, and then that moment where the the breeze suddenly collapsed and they weren't quick enough to get in off their trapeze they they did what we call in the business a tea bag and it was really expensive they never got back from that did they no and we saw them actually have two good starts the one on the uh, general recall and then the good start they executed so that does you know offer uh, i suppose a, a brief uh glimmer that, that that this won't be a trend because uh, that one instant uh, surely shouldn't happen again i mean sh i'm sure they say it shouldn't happen the first time but uh but you wouldn't, you know, so maybe they will bounce back from that and, and feel like they were just unlucky or, or just had one momentary issue. But uh, 20 second uh, puts the pressure on them. They don't have a drop. Uh, they, they haven't done this big drop, whereas the leaders, Jersok and Lorenz, are still uh, worst races of fifth. So, uh, Do you know uh, how important this race is as far as the Germans are concerned in terms of their selection for Tokyo 2020? I don't think it's of any importance, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Right, so we, as soon as we can, we'll go on to the water and uh, we'll start seeing them line up. So I'm hoping we'll get to see the boats as very soon. So there's the 3D graphics. You can see that it's a more even distribution of boats than we saw in the previous Just watch start. the ley lines dance at the top there. So that's off a of windbot. So uh, the windbot's showing that it's not steady. Uh, so I think we saw a bit of that in the last race, that there's lots of pockets of no wind and, and different angles uh, out there. And uh, it's going to be tough on the sailors, as we saw last time. Uh, the graphic here, at least, is showing a very square line. So hopefully uh, we do get a square start this time. And, uh, and we can get more of the fleet off into the race here. So, 1 minute 20. Confirmation that that line looks pretty square. We see boats all up and down it, uh, choosing different spots to be. So we should get a nice clean start here. Uh, we see the black flag up, so the race officer uh, given just the one shot to the, team, to the fleets for a general recall and straight into the black flag, which is good time management at uh, this late stage, of a day, or late stage of a day. Don't have any time for general recalls. That's right. So it's good to see. And it looks like most boats are going to be starting on a fairly comfortable starboard tack this time a much more even line and it, I mean, it's a very even spread isn't it yeah we've got uh tenstrom i see her there in uh, sweden 22 about fifth in from the boat okay bobik and tenstrom up at this end of the line two russian boats right up at this end of the line and then the canadians 27 27 seconds to go bit of a midline sag, people not taking too much of a risk with this black flag. Yeah, I think uh, with the black flag up, the, the teams will be happy to, to take a run at it and, and not make an unforced error, but there is an opportunity. I mean, honestly, teams could be accelerating right now in that midline sag and still be safe, so uh, being a little conservative here as we see this fleet edge forward, it, yeah, could, it could be that, that we're not 100% synced as well. So. Oh, there's definitely a bit of a giveaway in the middle by some of the boats. And there we go, there's the start. So the the boats near the pin actually uh, got off the line a little cleaner than the, the boats on this half, or the close half of the start line. And I do think it's a little bit pin favored. Uh, I think I think we're going to see some of the leaders initially emerge from that left-hand side. Russians here tacking out and going right, but we saw in the last race it was the left side that seemed to have a touch more wind, at least at times. Yeah, generally the left seemed to be the place to be, didn't it? Um, Henkel and Tobias up and amongst the front runners on the far side. 
That's uh, Zoya Novika and Diana Sabirova, who are the close Russians here. They've had a pretty good uh, regatta, or they've had some good races so far in this regatta. Uh, two poor races in a row, but before that, all top ten. So good to see that team, who's now in their third season, starting to have some good races and, uh, and getting off to a decent start here. And there's the Croatians, 1-1-2, uh, coming this way. So I'm not sure why we see one boat going backwards, it looks like, but uh, anyways... So very steady sailing so far. It looks like the breeze is pretty steady right now and, and uh, you know, strong enough, certainly, for this racing. The teams will be relieved that it, it's not lightening off anymore. Uh, it looked like around that finish line that it was very light, but uh, this is looking good. Lutz and Boyka. We see that gain line dancing all over the place, actually. So uh, lots of teams uh, as the shifts... Moving in, uh, vying for the lead. That Nielsen and Olsen off to a rocking start, uh, winning the pin and, and leading on the far side there. So that's great news for them. If they can follow up their uh, previous race uh, second with another good race. Early days, though, this is going to be a very tight battle up this beat. And Beckering and Dutz, the world champions who had such an awful race just now, they're also right next to Nielsen and Olsen sailing out to the left hand side. But we're looking at the boats, the Russians, uh, two boats closest to picture sailing out to the right-hand side, but based on previous trends, we wonder if this is going to be the place to be. This could be difficult to come back from. The trackers just put the Croatians into first place again, uh, very briefly, and now it's gone back to the far side as the wind dances around. But the Croatians uh, definitely have the settings right on it on this day. Croatians going quickly. Are they going quickly in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, so far it's looking pretty good for them. They. Uh, they're able to hold their lane and, and clearly have good enough speed and this side you know could easily work out we don't know that it won't for sure uh just took a little bit of a header there so uh, it's almost time to tack probably so could be just what they're looking for zooming in on, on the Nor novikova and sabirova as they uh sail the boat nice and flat steady. There's a big Russian fleet now in both the 49er and the 49er FX, uh, often training from uh, the Olympic venue there, from the Winter Olympics, but uh, on the Black Sea and then... And then That's uh, in Sochi, is it? Yeah, Sochi is uh, it's actually a summer vacation destination mostly and uh, was converted for the Olympics. There's the leaders, Croatians, tacking, so uh, we'll see if they're able to convert this good position into crossing some boats. I think there's a port tack boat there that they might struggle to get ahead of. Italy 80 looks like they might be ahead of them. Yeah, it does look like it, doesn't it? It didn't look like they're the best tack, uh, but Italy 80 looks more ahead than just a tack would indicate. Let's see how they do on this cross. They're the first starboard boat from this side going back, and uh, you always feel a little bit antsy as soon as that first boat crosses you about how many more there will be. Yes. So they might have good boat speed, the Croatians, but... Will it be enough? The, ju just going out of picture was uh, Ned won the reigning world champions, Annemiek Anna Beckering and Annette Dutz. They look pretty good on the far side. We can also see Germany 55 just through this gain line here, Jursak and Lorenz. So uh, the overall leaders not in, not in the dominant position uh, anyways. No. Looks like the, uh, the Dutch... Ned one are in a better position, and then the uh, the Danish also doing well on the far side. Cameraman's not showing us the leaders though. Is this is Brickwood, right? In two thirty. I think it is. Yeah. So Megan Brickwood uh, looks like she's a bit far, bit, bit launched forward on some of the other boats, and uh, approaching ley line there. Probably from that position, uh, she'll want to go a boat length or two past ley line and, and just be safe into it. I would think with so much uncertainty, you wouldn't want to have a couple people tack under you and then force you for a long period. We got a the cruising boat. Cruising boat getting out of the way. Fi figured out there's a race on, so that's good. Hopefully, not going to affect anyone too badly. This is this is interesting. Let's see if Brickwood can get across some boats here, and uh, and especially that left-hand pack. Uh, Looks like uh, Julie Bossard and Old Campan. The French boat 13 just tacking, forcing one of the Russian boats to tack away. 
that's tough when you're almost the far right boat and then having to tack even farther right. But uh, no love lost on the starboard ley line, especially of the first beat. So uh, Campan, Opasard and Campan just uh, taking the spot that's theirs and uh, sending them back out. That's Yamazaki and Takano uh, from Japan in 117, just going over top of Wank and Bertuzzi from Italy. So uh, the two of them locked into the starboard ley line, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot more boats get onto this ley line in the next uh, short while as boats make their way up to the top end of this beat. You can see as, as they sail closer to each other how they're, they're farther in boards than they were before is the cumulative effect of uh, lighter winds means they can trap less, so Brickwood and uh, Raggio Germani uh, on the gain line here. Tight lay line from Raggio Germani, so uh, there's still a little bit of time for a lift to come in, uh, but if they have to do two tacks, uh, it'll take some extra time, and, and then we see on the far side, Offerman coming in along with uh, Nielsen and Olsen. Just uh, the virtual has just, just told us that the left-hand side boats have taken the uh, lead, although it's still very close. So it's going to be a very messy windward mark. I hope we get some live uh, images of these two fleets coming together because it's going to be messy and there's going to be huge amounts of boat uh, points at stake as these two fleets come together. And, and a clean rounding would can mean an awful lot. I, I really do like that Brickwood positioning right now where she's going to have Raggio Germani uh, intercept that left-hand fleet first. There's going to be some, some people moving around, whereas Brickwood should get a much clearer lane to the Swinburne Mark, and, you know, obviously if there's some boats ahead, she won't lead, but uh, but she won't be interfered with nearly as much as Raggio Germani, who now looks to be pinching up uh, and trying to make that mark realize that a two tacks will be extremely painful, and unfortunately there's some, some motorboat ways she's going to have to deal with. So a lot at stake here as the final bits of this mark, of this uh, windward leg, come together. There's the nasty bit of chop for the Italians to go through, but are they going to be able to hold on to this ley line? If they can do this without any further tacking, the Italians will be in a very strong position. This is Offerman leading from the left-hand side, basically right on ley line, so uh, won't have any tacking rights if, uh, if there's an overlap, but might be able to just zip through and get the tack in and get around the mark without a foul. So let's see how close they are. That does look like Offerman's going to be able to get in it and tack around this mark and is going to go for it. Let's see. Yeah, they're going for the tack. So cleanly around. And let's see if Nielsen and Olsen can do the same or if they're, they're going to have to duck the Italians. Let's see. They're asking to cross. They're asking to cross. Let's see what uh, if they were given. Oh, they've got plenty of room there. So, oh. Just about. <laughs> Just about. I wonder if there's any hails of protest or not. Now we can see Brickwood has come. Uh, oh, no, this is the Italians. Okay, so. Well, there's uh just a little too zoomed in to see all the action, the young Canadian team, and that's Tina Lutz and Susan Boyka, Germany 29, getting their tack in. And now it's getting busy. Boats coming round by the second, and there's a lot of boats coming in on the port ley line. Very difficult for them to pick a way through all the hoisting boats that we see now. Great set from Lutz and Boyka there. Very steady from Tina Lutz on the angle as uh, Susan Boyka pulled up that Jenniker, and they'll have got the flow on very quickly. And Brickwood just around as well, so Brickwood in, up in about 8th place. Just looking for Jersok and Lorenz, we no, hope we don't them. see... No, no, that's them. Just oh, that's around. them, just going around now, okay. And uh, Henkin and Tobias from the USA, look at the Belgian Ooh. team just stuck. Someone's uh, going to hit that mark, it could be the Belgians, it could be Sweden, <laughs> 22. Six round uh, abreast at the windward mark, that's uh, Bobek and Tension also rocked up at the windward mark. Oh, that's ugly. Oh, it looks like the Swedes. Oh, it's all falling apart. I mean, yesterday they said they couldn't sail and they were still in third place. What are they going to say about themselves today? Sweden 22 hit that Look mark. Look at them just sculling, just sculling like crazy to try and get around. There is a tiny bit of current here, which perhaps is what's causing this chaos at the windward mark. Uh, but Bobek and Tenstrom are going to have to sail off and do a circle. Oh, There's the Beckering world champion. and Deutsch in the middle of it as well. Forced to tack, and now the Polish are stuck on the mark. So no one's going to get around. Uh, that's Wester and Nestor. Uh, in uh, Sweden 999 just making it around now and they're going to go put their uh, country women under threat and uh, a couple boats get around I think that was set the another one of the Russian teams and we see the world champions just sculling like crazy to try to get around the mark 
What an ugly mark rounding for so many of these teams. So Beckring and Deuce having an absolute shocker today. The world champions really not showing world championship winning form on what is proving to be a really tricky day for some of the best teams out there. And we're, we're seeing another not so common name up at the front, uh, Willemine Offerman and Elise de Reuter from the Netherlands leading this race. And again, it's Bad Nielsen and Olsen, the more experienced team, chasing down the lesser experienced crew. We, so, we saw the Croatians manage to hold on for the win against the Danes, but will the Danes be able to overtake the Dutch this time round? We saw uh, in dramatic fashion at the European Championship uh, about a month ago how uh, Beckering and Deutz won the Olympic spot for the Netherlands, and I think uh, Offerman has been uh, confirmed as the and De Reuter have been confirmed as the training partner through to Tokyo. So they're uh, still charging forward, and without maybe the burden of uh, of trying to qualify and beat a world champion, uh, we see them sailing well. Well, certainly sailing well into the what we think is the right hand, well, it's the correct corner based on what we've seen so far. And if this, and if the results hold as they are right now, this would move Offerman into uh, second place overall in the standings. It, uh, it's that close. So with so many teams now having deep races, we're really going to see a mix-up in the overall scoreboard. Of course, lots of sailing left to go. We only are on the second leg of four in this and, race. Yeah, no one's on a breakaway yet, are they? No. I mean, it, it looks like uh, there are many boats. Lutz Boyka, two Italian teams, bottom right of picture, that could also attack for the lead. But Offerman and De Reuter just managing to hold on, and Bad Nilsson and Olsen not afraid to hit that ley line early. No, they're not, are they? That's uh, it's always a tricky spot because you don't know exactly when uh, what kind of air lane you're going to get. But they obviously feel comfortable going all the way to the ley line and, and just sailing outside the pack of boats, which can be a good technique uh, in light air downwinds. Well, yet again, Jersok on Lorenz jiving early, it paid well for them in the very last lap of that last leg of the last race, rather. So uh, they're. You know, what, what I like about this strategy is they, they don't have any uh, bad air to deal with. They, they get to sail this entire leg uh, in clean air and, and leading into a, an area that shouldn't have too much of the bulge in the wind around it. So uh, back in with the leaders, Offerman and De Reuter, under a little bit of pressure now, according to the virtual from Nielsen and Olsen. So. Well, this is so similar to the run of the previous race where the Danes managed to overtake the Croatians. Are the Danes going to be able to employ the same tactic? and? overtake these Dutch that we see in picture now. I think the I think the Dutch are in a, a closer to the ley line than the Croatians were last leg. But uh, but yeah, Nielsen and Olsen are threatening uh, certainly um, the lead here and uh, this is exactly how they took the lead in the last race and almost tied on virtual and certainly if they go into the three boat length zone of this lured mark overlapped you'd think uh, Nielsen and Olsen would have the advantage so at this point Offerman and De Reuter might be thinking of going to the far side uh, which based on where they came from from the, the from the last beat will not be their preferred option so they're really fighting for the sides of the course here not that the right was terrible it was it had That's more right. to offer it was very even anyway so they shouldn't you know, fight too hard. It does look like they're going to be able to soak low and get in ahead of Nielsen Olsen just from this overhead picture. I'd say they're going to be able to do whatever they want. Uh, Nielsen and Olsen, yeah, they look like they're going to sail extra distance here and, and now have to reach up, but uh, still a pretty solid position and, and solidly in second place. So going for the jibe drop, Netherlands 64, choosing to go out to the left hand side. And the Danes have loved the left hand side all day, so I wonder if they're going to follow them round. Yeah, from, from that deep outside, I imagine they will do a jibe, set, a jibe drop also. Um, so that's making life a little bit more simple for Netherlands 64. Offerman and De Reuter leading this race ahead of the Danes, who were second in the previous race. They briefly held the lead of the previous race, but this is turning into a really good day for Nielsen and Olsen, because no one else is showing that kind of consistency so far today. Marian Di Stefano coming down for third place around the Lua Gate. Nearly won that gold medal in Genoa a couple of months ago. Here's Lutz and Boyka coming into the near side. So this is the first boat we've seen come around the near side. And uh, the Llewellyn La France sisters from Canada uh, having their best race here of uh, their European season. So very good sailing from that young team. Another good race for the Croatians who won the previous race, Ninchevic and Demel. And Michele we also Vittori. see Yersok and Lorenz uh, in the... They're, oh, they've jived around out of that. That was looking ugly if they'd tried to force themselves uh, to the far side of the course. So Jirsok and Lorenz. Solid race for them. Solid race for them. Top 10. And now it's getting busy. We can see... Oh, we're, we're going upwind here with 
uh, Lutz and Boyka, who are in fourth place in this race and fourth place in the regatta right now. They've got the Croatians dead uh, behind them, and then uh, the leaders of all, th all three leaders have gone to the other side of the race course. So back in at the leeward marks, um, a little more orderly than, uh, than the last time where we saw a big stack up, because I guess the stack up happened at the windward marks uh, on this race, but still very light when this many boats have come together. And I actually kind of like where Henkin and Tobias have tacked there. If they can get their f flow through, maybe they can get some clear air. Just uh, Yeah, just a bit of disturbance with the downwind boats. But there you can just see at the back of the fleet, Bobek and Tengstrom and Beckering and Dutz even further back. So the world champions with only two or three boats behind them. And it's really falling apart for the world champion Dutch today. It's their training partners, the tune-up partners of the world champions who are actually leading the way. Offerman and De Reuter from the Netherlands, ahead of Nielsen and Olsen. Second in the last race, currently lying second in this race. Lutz and Boyka. Lutz and Boyka is showing like they're sailing on a lift right now. Um, so I don't know how shifty it's been, but certainly in, in a decent uh, spot right now. Um, the Bobek graphic is showing Jersok and uh, Lorenz. Uh, you know, struggling basically uh, in the middle of this group. So they, they should be able to start to reestablish some boat speed here in the in the middle, but it's a tricky spot to be in the middle of a pack like this. You wouldn't think there'd be a ton of wind there. No. And uh, It's and sort of all been sucked out by those Jenicas on the way downwind. And yeah. So sailing back through the triangle of death. Much happier to be Offerman and De Reuter here who uh, have clear, clear water and clear wind and basically the fleet mostly following them. I, they can just go to this ley line and tack and... Uh, and I don't think they'd have too much worrying about it. I mean, obviously, it's relatively difficult to call a ley line from such a long distance, but they only have to get it close to right. Tacking from that side of the course is not a super critical ley line, is it? No, it's not. And we see uh, the graphics are showing us that Lutz Boyker are now uh, occasionally uh, taking the lead on the virtual, but uh, we can never quite trust the uh, gain line. Actually, uh, not quite in the lead, but uh, certainly having an okay uh, lane across, but uh, it seems like more and more of the fleet is going towards the left-hand side, which the leading Dutch, Offerman and De Reuter, have uh, owned, uh, came up, were very decisive in choosing that side of the course again, and didn't give an inch to uh, Nielsen and Olsen, and uh, made the life very simple. Offerman and De Reuter looking comfortable on this side of the course. Bud Nielsen and Olsen still the biggest threat, but not that much of a threat for the Dutch right now. Considering that it's such light breeze, it, it is actually reasonably steady in direction. But looks Boyka looking okay on this side of the track. that we see there. Just seeing a few of the 49ers get to the race course here, so they're waiting for their turn to race after this race is over. We've got two 49er races on the schedule, so uh, lots of racing action in this twilight uh, here in Kiel, Germany, as the sea breeze has finally come in. Lutz and Boyke in tight here as they cross, the, as they cross uh, from the right-hand uh, lane over and try and protect their fourth place position in this race. Uh, which is going to see them very well into uh, into a solid day if they can keep holding it up. Virtual th showing them up into third place in this race now, so uh, passing the Italians who rounded and went to the far side. see Germany, northern Germany in a nutshell here. We've got beautiful racing, we've got the beach, and we've got the wind farm in the background, uh, along with some nice countryside. So <laughs> everything we expect to see in northern Germany is on display here in this great racing with the... Uh, and the sunshine is a bonus. And the sunshine is a bonus, that's right. Germany 29 in third place. Okay, so, so we can see the Italians tacked. And, uh, and are crossing behind, so that's a solid gain for Lutz Boyka, and they're uh, not too far, oh, they've tacked, okay, so they're tacking underneath. A bit surprised at that, I'm surprised they didn't uh, go to the ley line, but 
Well, you, you can see that there's not a lot of ley line left to play with. So that, that's, a, that's a fairly good defensive move by Germany, I would have thought. Yeah, they, they maybe didn't want to have to descend themselves from Nielsen and Olsen. So just tacked straight ahead of the Italians to confirm that spot. And then they can look later in the race. Oh, the Italians had to tack out. So they forced the Italians into two extra tacks. And, you know, Nielsen and Olsen have not shied away from the ley lines at all. And, uh, you know, they're going to have a chance here to to push off from it, at least for the lead, again, uh, by using the ley lines. Yeah, they've been hitting it hard all day of Denmark 7, but they're also the boat that has been in second place in both races. No one else coming close to matching that kind of consistency so far. Look, just a very deep, minor, small detail of 49er sailing here, but look how much room there is between the bridle uh, of this boat, uh, of the Danish leaders here. So they uh, aren't able to get the boom all the way to center line without squeezing down too hard. I'm actually surprised they've, they've got it set up that way. Uh, normally, yeah, if you raise the bridle up a little higher, you can get the boom closer to center line. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll have to ask them if there's some other trick we're missing out on. But anyways, uh, they're the, the leaders. Spot. So, uh, it's quite east as well, isn't it, on the jib? So the sail's generally quite loose, quite full, not pushing for height, pushing for speed. Nice little pull on the mast from the crew as she steps forwards in front of the mast. Very smooth sailing there. Change over at main sheet and, and a clear lead for Netherlands 64. Coming up to this Wimmer Mark for the final time of race two in the Gold Fleet at the 49er FX at Kiel Week. Well, yeah, very solid lead here. So it extended quite a bit in this, uh, probably gained by having just very clear water, especially on the, the initial port with everyone else following them. And, uh, you know, just sailed to the corner here and uh, should be a nice race win for these, uh, for these young Dutch sailors. And Denmark 7 going around the mark, and if you plotted Denmark 7's trace in today's races so far, it would just be two sides of a triangle all day. Yeah, straight to the ley line, minimize maneuvers, keep as uh, fresh wind as you can, and uh, that's been their uh, ticket to success. So let's see, this should be a close uh, battle between the Italians and Lutzboika. Looks like Lutzboika are still clearly ahead, and... Uh, you know, it's tough to threaten ahead from there, so they'll be probably on the defensive as they go downwind, but a straight set should see them in uh, good form. And uh, there's the Italians, and uh, Llewellyn, Llewellyn LaFrance's sisters uh, from Canada having a good race as well, so showing uh, we saw them. Well, that's a good game for them on the left-hand side, isn't it? So, so uh, that left-hand side's worked out quite well for the Danes and for the Canadians, I think. Yeah, next into the wind marks the Croatians. Uh, followed by another Italian team, the uh, Raggio Germani duo. Oh, when we see Beckering and Deutz there just went up wind, so not as far back as uh, as we saw them at times. Should uh, should the Niels be Denmark 49 still going up wind? So a poor race from them after they were doing so well in the first race of the day. Well, that's very impressive from Beckering and Deutz if, uh, if they managed to get even halfway up this fleet. Uh, they're showing 16th overall uh, in this race right now. Sorry, 16th in this race, so a uh, bit of a catch-up, but still a lot of points to score because they're keeping them all. Good speed by the leaders, 7.8 knots. Just a little bit faster than the Danes who are chasing them. And good speed from Lutz Boyka, doing at times over 8 knots. Yeah, very uh, notably high average speed from Lutz Boyka, higher than uh, the teams around them, but uh, a lot of distance to catch up to make a gain. No one's done the drive off yet. Just looking at the Llewellyn and the France sisters, they got uh, rolled by two boats there, so uh, just probably a little inexperienced, didn't notice some teams creeping up on them and, uh, and lost a, a place or two, but uh, they'll be keeping an eagle eye out in the future from behind them. So, however late Offerman and De Reuter jive, I wonder if the Danes will carry on even further because they've been hitting that ley line so hard all day. Surely the Dutch have to jive fairly soon. 
Yeah, you know, it'll be, uh, there's a lot of boats out there now with the 49ers tuning up, you know, theoretically outside the course. They go for their jibe now, but it actually can be, it can screw up the natural rhythm of how you look around a race course to have a bunch of boats kind of so close to your own course. So hopefully uh, Offerman and De Reuter can uh, find a ley line they're comfortable with. And we don't see Nielsen and Olsen having gone straight, so I, I wonder if Nielsen and Olsen have also jibed. Yeah, it must be. It must be. It, it makes you think that the Dutch lead must be still quite comfortable. If yeah. you can ever call it comfortable when you're crouching in the middle oh, of the Oh, no, I was just, you can see yeah. Nielsen and Olsen at the back there. So no, just like you said, they've gone farther. <laughs> there doesn't From the virtual, it didn't look like there was much farther to go. But uh, listen, if uh, something's working, you keep going to it, right? Uh, Right, Andy, is uh, Nielsen and Olsen loving the far, far side. Well, the, the least consistent tactics seem to be delivering the most consistent results today. It's not meant to work like that, but the Danes are pushing the corners and, and so far a second in the first race, second in this race. Well, when you find a corner that works... Uh, hit it hard. Hit it hard. I mean, yeah, that's one thing uh, a lot of the greats can do is they work out early what's working and then have the execution to just keep doing it and, and don't need uh, the creativity to try and do something different. Just keep yeah. going until it doesn't work. But the Dutch really have stretched away and Annemiek Beckering may be a long way back in this race but the world champion qualified for Tokyo 2020 can at least see that her tuning partner has some world class pace as well even if they're not going to next year's games. Yeah, and they, I, I really like the way they handled that lure gate. Um, they could have gone to the far side and and not pushed things, but they actually sailed a low course, did the jibe, knowing that uh, the Danes would do the same thing, and then they had, they've had no pressure the rest of the race course. They just uh, had everyone following them, and obviously, like you say, they have the pace to, to keep it up, so uh, so easy sailing for them and, and a well-earned victory. And the Danes, if anything, look like they have a little bit more pace, just going a little bit higher. Not surprising, maybe, seeing as they've overstood that ley line slightly more than the Dutch. But it looks like there's another boat that's got, gone even further than the Danes. I think maybe it's the Italians. So people really hitting that corner hard. But not long for the Netherlands to go now. The Finnish boat just comes into view, the orange flag yeah, so you can see there's there's plenty of room outside there. They didn't even hit the lay line with 100%. They, they had a whole finish line to work with. That's true. <laughs> so a fantastic finish for Offerman and De Reuter from the Netherlands winning that race. And we are seeing, well, I say a few more surprises, but I know you're going to fill me in with the overall results after we see this race finish, Ben. And uh, you can update me with how Offerman and De Reuter are going overall in this regatta. Yeah, as we see Nielsen and Olsen coming into the finish line. Oh, uh, they the came at least a boat length high on that ley line. Yeah, two, uh, two seconds for them. Wonderful sailing. That's, uh, that's really good from them. They've now, uh, on uh, the virtual, moved up to third overall uh, with Offerman in second overall. So far, uh, Offerman and De Reuter have sailed a 3 7 8 one, eight, four. So Close battle here. third place now. Who's going to get it? Will Amari and Di Stefano on port jive be able to get it? Got front? a port starboard situation, but it looks like the Italians were clear ahead, so they made a pass. And they, they really hit that ley line even harder than the Danes, so going hard into that corner was the way to go. Just follow the follow the Danes, Nielsen and Olsen. They knew what to do, and uh, you know, Lutz and Boyka will be disappointed there to lose a place on that downwind because it was kind of an unforced error. They didn't uh, they didn't have much of a chance of making a pass, so they didn't defend as well as they could have, and uh, makes a difference. Those Italians in light winds are quick as well. I, I don't know if they were putting the Germans under pressure earlier up their leg, but uh, th those Italians are certainly ones to watch in these light winds. And uh, another one to watch. Winners of the previous race, uh, Ninchevich and uh, Michele Vittori from Croatia. But this is also Jersok and Lorenz, our overall leaders, showing that uh, in the light and in the windy conditions, they're doing well. And uh, that was a little too close from the Croatians. I'm surprised on a port starboard uh, they pushed it that close because actually if they don't, if Jersok and Lorenz don't get that and they feel they were fouled, uh, they could do a protest and, and cause an unnecessary uh, DSQ. But I'm not, I'm not sure... Uh, T what do you, who do you think won uh, across the line there? It was very close. Oh, I, I couldn't call that, but I am concerned about the Croatians and whether they fouled the Germans or not. So Reggio and Germani from Italy just crossing, and then it's three boats all vying to cross together. It's the Canadians, the British, and the Swiss Gross Klinger 
Looks like Gross Klinger has the best speed right now, but it's the Canadians on the far Canadians side. Canadians go for their jibe. Let's see if they can do a second jibe now. Now they have rights to go low uh, to get into that finish line. And, oh, well, we can't call? call it, but they did get the Brit, so... Uh, I think maybe Gross Klinger just managed to get ahead of the Canadians with the Brits coming off worse out of those three. Yeah, I'd agree uh, with that. Henkin and Tobias coming down with the Black Jenica, just a boat length or two away, rolling into a jibe. Tobias, formerly Anna Tunnicliffe, change of name, but uh, the 2008 Olympic champion in the laser radial. Had a go at London 2012 Games, was the favourite going into the 2012 Games in the women's match racing. Came away with no medal, gave up sailing for a bit. Oh, actually did a bit of 49er FX sailing in the early days. Went into the CrossFit Games well, done extremely well there, but is back in the game campaigning for Tokyo 2020. Tokyo 2020 and uh, so I'm, I'm interested, Japanese just crossing now. I'm interested to see where our, our leaders coming into the day, Beckering and Deutz and uh, Boba Kentenstrom are. We haven't seen any of them yet. Uh, those were second and third. Oh, so here we have... Was that Boba Contention coming well, through right now? Beckering and Dudes in the middle of the track. Um, there not was quite a Swedish finishing. boat that just went through, but I think that was, uh, that was uh, West, uh, Wester and Nestor. Nestor. Yeah, so this is Beckering, Beckering and Deutsch having a, having a horrible day for them right now. That's uh, still 16th place. And we can see from the overall uh, how that's shaken up the leaderboard here. So this is in the race uh, Offerman and uh, De Reuter. Again, a very sh short distance, so uh, sailing a short distance is paying off. And very few maneuvers, look at that, eight maneuvers, seven maneuvers from Ben Nielsen and Olsen. So, uh, and also the greatest distance sailed by Nielsen and Olsen. So confirming what we've been saying all day about just hitting those corners, not afraid to do the extra distance, just to put themselves in that favored left-hand corner where there's been better breeze all day for these two races. And I wonder how well that information would have passed across to the 49ers that are about to race on this track. Oh, you can bet any uh, any coach out there worth the salt is watching the live broadcast. So, uh, of course they are. How could they be watching anything else? The uh, no, I don't think the phones have to go away till race time. So, uh, no doubt some of them are watching, and uh, it's a pretty one-way track actually. I'd say right now, like maybe not obviously, like you can definitely find a few things, but consistently that left side's not going to hurt you. So. Um, Team, I, I bet there'll be a big fight here for the pin end of the line and, and many teams going left for the majority of the 49er racing if it stays as we've seen for the 49er FX racing here. So the uh, Czechs and the Russians bringing up the rear. That's for, the end of the 49er FX race two. Yeah, so we've had a big shake up in the overall leaderboard since we joined the day with uh, Yersok and Lorenz staying very steady, uh, extending their lead up to 10 points now, but over a new, uh, over a new second place team of Offerman and De Reuter, who, uh, who are now 10 points back based off that victory. So Jersok and Lorenz have got to be thrilled, you know, to, to be leading, to be leading after uh, two windy days and then have a very strong light air performance as well. Shows the breadth of their skill right now and how they're feeling with their sailing. Yeah, yeah, a fantastic return to form for them. And uh, also uh, interesting to see Nilsson and Olsen. I mean, uh, they've got a UFD. They, got a, uh, they were disqualified for starting early um, in the qualifying series, uh, which forced them to count the 20th from yesterday. If it wasn't for that... That uh, 20th must have been a capsize as well because they're so quick in the breeze. Uh, there's no way that 19 boats would be ahead of them in a qualifying race. So uh, that capsize proving, I mean, they'd, have, uh, they'd be in the overall lead right now if, uh, with just a regular race for them in the breeze. So overall, they're sailing tremendously well right now. And the Germans stepping up because the, the Germans generally have been a little bit off the pace um, in terms of a squad. Um, we've got uh, 12 minutes to the start of our next race. Um, so we're just going to look at the highlights from yesterday to get you warmed up with uh, what happened in the racing uh, in previous days before we get back out to the 49er course for their two races. The temperature might have been cooler in Kiel, but Thursday's races were running hot. Today was the turn of the NACRA 17, a spectacular catamaran capable of up to 50 kilometers an hour above the water. 
Germany's most promising candidates for Tokyo 2020 are here. Johannes Polgar and Karolina Werner, along with Paul Koloff and Alisa Stulema. In the first race, Koloff and Stulema won the start but had to give up their lead. The teams from Denmark and Italy pulled off better maneuvers than the German duo. The Danish team almost capsized but got away with it. The Italians managed to overtake on the second downwind leg, going on to win the first race comfortably. Further back, the German teams were fighting their own battle and finished fourth and seventh respectively. We had a lot of fun. We were in the groove. That was very important for us. On the next downwind leg, we didn't let anyone overtake us. In the second race, Polgar and Werner were over the line too early, so they were disqualified. It was even more unfortunate for the Italian team. Maeli Frascari fell off the trapeze in the midst of a jiving duel with Koloff and Stulema. We were fighting with Paul for top spot. We had very fast falling jibe and probably when she was, she was trying to be as fast as possible outside on trapeze, she missed the hook and just dropped in the water. The Germans narrowly avoided a capsize, then ensued a classic match race in the third race between Koloff, Stulema and the Spaniards, Pacheco and Trittel. After a great mark rounding, the German duo got their boat foiling upwind and launched themselves to another victory. We have strong competitors here and we're really enjoying racing with them. Celebrating their second place across the finish, the Austrians did a bit of showboating for the crowd, as Thomas Zajac explained. My crew, Babsi, is always looking forwards, and I like to shock her a little bit. Consistent scores in the top three places Zajac and Mats in third overall, and the Austrians are loving their time at Kiel Week. So, uh, contrast the conditions that we saw uh, yesterday compared with what we've just been commentating on now. Don't, don't you love the variety that sailing brings? <laughs> Absolutely. It's hard to imagine it's the same sport after uh, watching uh, the NACRA highlights from yesterday with uh, Thomas Zajac there doing a jump across the finish line. Ought to be mandatory. Uh, love totally the passion agree. there. Totally agree. It should be extra points for how you cross the finish line. Uh, but the points all count the same between that racing that we saw yesterday and what we're going to see today. So uh, one's a big wrestle with the boat and the conditions and the other's a dance uh, with a whole bunch of uh, boats equally able to sort of maneuver in these light conditions and uh, and they all count the same which is the wonder of our sport that so much of it and so many different things have to be learned there is a little bit more of a mix up of the typical pecking order on a day like today though in the light of winds we are tending to see some of the lesser known names coming to the fore and we're seeing some of the big names in the FX just now really struggling so the reigning world champions are really not managing to get to grips with today Anamik Beckering and Annette Dutz. Um, now we move on to the 49er men's golf fleet and uh, I wonder what uh, what kind of um, upsets we might see within that fleet. Absolutely and it's not even going to be fair to call it upsets. We've got 28 boats out there and there's only a 33 point difference between first and last going into today. So um, with 28 points to score in every race we're going to see a massive shift in the leaderboard and we don't know which way it's going to go yet. Uh, the teams that have done well so far you know with three with three fleets uh, of, of qualifying, uh, even excellent score lines uh, doesn't get you too many points, uh, and then you go into Gold Fleet, and that's always the way it is in 49er sailing. Uh, it doesn't really matter how well you do in qualifying, you got to get into that Gold Fleet, and then the game starts again. So that's what we're going to see here today. So yeah, if you if you finish ninth in one of these, um, th your third of the flights, that's you multiply that by three, and you've actually finished 27th, which is barely enough to get you through into the Gold Fleet final. Yeah, it's. it's it's really difficult to understand and get your head around that. We can, we're about seven or eight minutes away from the next 49er start, and we can see the boats tuning up on this race course. The, looks like it's a little bit shifted right, maybe, from what we saw earlier, but uh, roughly the same. Uh, let's hope we have enough wind uh, that these boats, they'll be a little more powered up even in the same wind because the sails are bigger. Um, but we've got uh, the, the possibly, I think it would be the best sailors on earth here right now and they're in the lead but like you say it's a vulnerable spot to be in the light wind so Burling and Took got 27 boats to, to f uh, fight with and uh, see if they can maintain their lead or at least really stay in the game you don't need to actually uh, try and win anything today it's about having a couple solid races there's only two races on the schedule and uh, all these teams will just be looking to really escape from the day uh, pretty much none of these teams have a 
bad race uh, other than a few teams that have UFDs and DNFs. So uh, any any race out of the top 10 here is really uh, one that they're going to have to count the scores, and, and two races out of the top 10 will be a big dent. There, there's a couple of big names that haven't done terribly well in the qualifying. Um, so I'm thinking of, say, uh, Germany's Schmidt Burma, former European champions, down in what, 14th and 15th, alongside James Peters and Finn Sterrett, newly crowned the uh, the world number ones on the the ranking system. Second at the World Championships a couple of years ago, second at the European Championships. Both real world class acts, and both stuck in the mid teens right now. So, well, I'm looking at Button and Mara, world number two, down in 22nd. Uh, so, you know. Well, there's a did not finish there, and we know the story of that did not finish because we, we spoke about it a That's couple right. of days ago, and it all fell apart for them very quickly, didn't it? They were not quite making the, the lay line on the, um, on the starboard approach. They were in the lead, but not quite making the low line, lay line. The, the boat was second, a Dutch boat passed just behind them, tacked on their hip, prevented the Spanish from tacking. They sort of tacked anyway, but ended up um, having to do a 360, as I remember. And, and then they eventually got round the mark, maybe in about 10th, um, and then went for a jibe set hoist and then capsized on that hoist. And the next thing you know, um, they're on the, their side. They've dropped to last. They don't even finish the race. Right. Yeah. So right now, that was a DNF, and their drop is a 17. So if they'd been able to win or come second in that race, they would be all the way up in 10th place. But as it is, they're down in 22nd. Uh, but like we said, today's racing is actually going to be hugely important, and all 28 teams can win any race uh, in this fleet. So... Um, it all kind of starts again, and we're going to see it unravel here today. Who do, of the we, we see the Antipodean nations as uh, as we see taking four of the top six spots. So that's uh, three from New Zealand and an Australian: Burling Toop, Phillips Phillips, Dunning Beck Gunn, and McCarty McKenzie. Um, it has been windy so far, though. Do you reckon those teams are going to be able to keep on with that dominant trend in the light? I do, actually. I mean, in the olden days, you'd have said, oh, those Antipodeans, they're only any good in the breeze, and the Italians are only any, any good in the light winds. That's how it used to be when I was racing for 70s, 30 years ago. You pretty much pick the Mediterraneans to win in light winds and um, the, uh, the Northern Europeans to win in strong winds. It's, they're, they're, I don't see it nearly as cut and dried like that anymore. And, and I, uh, yeah, Burling and Chute, and Burling, Burling is a big guy, but he's very light on his feet for a big guy. I wonder if he's going to have his boots off today. Absolutely. There's no, way any, there's no way they're wearing shoes. They set that trend ages ago. I bet you'll see at least a third of the fleet in bare feet now, which is nuts considering all the things you can kick. But, uh, Are but they born with 3M a... rubber on their feet? I mean, if I tried that, I'd be sliding all over the place. It'd be like an ice rink. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you're allowed to wear shoes in New Zealand until you're uh, eight years old, so it right. toughens things up. But, Otherwise, you uh, get your passport taken away. <laughs> I'm also interested to see how the French fleet does here. Speaking of the Mediterranean fleets, that squad is looking really strong these days. They've got four boats in the gold fleet, and um, you know, they're all prepping for 2020, but also setting themselves up for 2024. We've got uh, the world number or the second from last year's uh, World Championships, uh, Matthew Frey and. Uh, and uh, Noe there, Noe Delpesh, who uh, who are uh, down in 20th place. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for movement all the way top to bottom of this fleet. Have the French ever won a medal at the Olympic Games in the men's 49er? No, they've had a couple fourths, but... Uh, no yeah, medals for that. that's sort of strange, isn't it? Yeah, they've been a, there's been a French men in contention, French team in contention every time, uh, but no medals yet. So uh, no doubt uh, that one of these French teams will be looking to turn around that uh, that record. Now Fisher and Graf, they have the number three on the sail, third at the Worlds in Aarhus in Denmark last year. They're third overall here, and uh, we've got one minute to go. And closest to look at that line, look how. We can see across the start line. It's probably a U flag, although it's down already. There, it just goes down right now. And there is not a moment to be given. But we what see about Burling and Tuke having bailed out. Uh, so they obviously have decided there isn't enough room on the pin to get that spot. And they're going to, I suppose, try and start on port here, unless they try and make another run at the pin. But uh, it looks a bit desperate to me. I don't think that was what, the Burling, what Burling and Tuke had in mind. It looks like a salvage job to me. So what are the reigning Olympic champions being able Oh, there's a surge there. There's a couple of boats that are going to get called for uh, UFD here is my guess, but uh, that is a dead straight. That's incredible, isn't it? 23 seconds to go. Everyone's just dead upwind. You'll see them skull down with probably only seven or eight seconds to go. No, no one can creep forward. This is, I mean, 
the race committee here is uh, that that midline ball just well over the line now. So Burlington too, actually probably looking pretty good if this race holds. But I'd say that's six or seven boats over in the middle of the line, if not more. So what will the call be? What, the start gun fires, they launch off the line. Will the race stand or will there be a recall? Not a good acceleration by the Pin M boat. So it is a general recall. And there'll be a couple of boats breathing a sigh of relief about that. None more so than Burling and Took. They didn't even get themselves lined up for a port hand start, so maybe they just saw the bulge and said this is going to be recalled. But that's a well, pretty... Well, that's a bit uh, cocky. Uh, uh, I don't sure know what happened, that. but they, they, they weren't even moving. So uh, general recall there, and we get to do it all again. And no doubt it'll be black flag next time. But uh, a dead straight line, fleet lined up, but uh, couldn't hold back. One of the crazy trends that we saw in Miami, which was light winds at the beginning of the year in January, was uh, boats lining up with eight minutes to go before the start, lining up above the start, and then just gradually drifting back so that come the start gun, they would be on the line. So lining up eight minutes beforehand, they were even talking about the possibility of their coach boat holding them in position until releasing them at the five minute gun. I mean, that's, that's how competitive it's getting in this starting. And you, and you can see a perfect example of that in the, the recalled start we saw just now. I mean, you when I started my 49er career, you know, lining up at two and a half minutes, three minutes was considered novel and, and neat. And now you're talking about triple that because they can hold it. And, uh, and once the spot's gone, if you can hold it, it's, it's gone for good. There's no, you know, the boats do have a fair bit of width and especially with the tiller extensions, um, there's only room for so many. And if, uh, you know, if there's a boat there lining up for the pin, I don't know if they're going to try and hold it till the next race goes, but, uh, but that would be about the spot. They'd probably think they can hold for eight minutes, or yeah. six minutes. So, well, it, it clearly wasn't a spot that Burling and Chute could hold because they obviously wanted the pin end start and they didn't quite manage to hold on to it and they probably wisely bailed out early. But that was very even spread of boats across the line, so I don't think there's any complaints about line bias. I, I think it feels like this is an equal opportunity start line. It was. Uh but having looked at that last race in the 49er effects, it might not be considered an equal opportunity race course. And, uh, and you know, that we saw, we saw the leaders come from winning the pin uh, in the 49er effects race and, and just going straight to the, to the far left side, both upwind and downwind. Uh, and Burling and Took obviously knew that and, and wanted to try and do the same, didn't get that pin spot, and they're going to get a second shot at it. Uh, there'll be a, you know... There's room for two or three teams to all line up and, and kind of guess how close they can hold uh, the spot to the pin boat. And uh, if you're one of them, you get to fight it out. And I guess there weren't too many people intimidated by the, too intimidated by the number one to, to just give it to them. Maybe people will be more intimidated by a change of flag color on the committee boat. So if it does go from new flag to black flag, how will that affect the lineup? Could be a little bit more conservative. I, I we're not going to see it that conservative though. I mean, uh, obviously teams can't go over this time, so they would have known they were going over in that last race, and and just sort of once you're over in a U flag start, there's absolutely no benefit to to pushing back, right? Because you're done for that race, so you actually want the general recall at that yeah. stage. Uh, so those teams would then actually move forward on purpose and push, try and push the boats around them to go forward. So uh, we might as well ruin it for everyone if you've ruined it for yourself. It is the smart tactic at that stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. So about four minutes to the start of the next race. I'm actually surprised they went with the U-flag that one. I think this would have been a, a candidate to just stick with the black flag. But in this amount of wind speed, it's just always deadly to, uh, to start. And the team's just push and push and push. Uh, but obviously the race officer felt like he, f he owed it to the fleet to give him one shot with only a slightly lesser penalty. But uh, I, I think the race officer does feel like that. Like, oh, I, I don't want to be seen as the bad guy. I think a lot of the sailors just think, you know what? I don't care. Just get on with it. I won't take it personally. They certainly wouldn't take it personally on the race officer. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> they just play the game, whatever game's laid out. So uh, anyways. Now, will the black flag be strong enough to keep them behind the line? That's the question. These starts are so competitive. That's ultimately what happened with the with the blue with the blue Peter flag. Like it was, oh, we'll give them one one shot at no penalty start, and it was just a general recall every time in the Olympic fleets across the whole Olympic classes, and they just did away with it. Poor old blue Peter flag. Yeah, he just can't be too kind to these Olympic sailors. So. Uh, we're hearing that uh, maybe this start isn't going to go ahead straight away. Uh, there's not enough wind. It's, it's under the class wind limit. So the, the postponement flag is up. And 
So we're going to have to wait and see what happens in terms of uh, when we might get this start away. So that's a bit of a shame. It is, because it actually you know, looked okay in that 49er FX racing uh, for getting going. So uh, I'm a little surprised that the winds died down now, but this is, you know, we're, we're using a thermal breeze right now, and the, and the system breeze is still going offshore against us, albeit very lightly. So I'm not sure if it's too late to race now what's going what's gonna to drive the wind to increase. So unfortunately, there's a chance we're seeing the end of racing for the day. But to be honest, I mean, looking at how the fleet's moving right now, I'm, I'm surprised the race officer isn't getting on with it. That's the, that's the cost of, you know, not using a black flag. Possibly. I mean, I'm not... I'm not oh, you're being harsh there, I'm aren't being you? harsh, but, uh, you know, when, when everything's right on the edge, uh, including time of day, uh, you don't want to use up the minutes. So uh, just looking at who's here, we've got the top three from last year's World Championship. We've got the Croatians, Shimo Fantella and Miho Fantella, who won last year's World Championship. That was a bit of a surprise. We've got France, too. Mathieu Fry and Noé Delpecht. And in third, we've got Tim Fisher and Fabian Graf. Now, um, I would say that none of those are necessarily seen as, as top draw, top string sailors, perhaps with, with the, uh, the exception of the Fantellas, who haven't been in the boat very long, only two years, but are coming on extremely strongly. Well, what would you... I mean, am I being unfair about last year's top three at the Worlds? Was that, was that a slightly strange world championship? Yeah, it was a bit of a strange world championship. It was in uh, Aarhus where we, um, where we saw very flat waters. So waves can often be a, a major differentiator in how the fleet does. Uh, and also, we didn't see as many races as we normally do. I think it was only a 12-race series versus 18 or so at our major championships. And, uh, and with it being shifty uh, and also the flat water, I, I think it gave more teams a chance to be elite because the boat handling did, didn't wasn't uh, such a challenge to differentiate. So more general sailing skills, let's say picking shifts, getting the right puffs, would have played into it. And of course, you know, there's probably 25 to 40 teams who all feel like they could uh, win races and win championships on their day. And and I think that's what we saw at last year's championship. Is uh, most of the top 10 wouldn't have been necessarily the favorite top 10, but just the skill level so high now uh, that the that there's so many teams who can play the game. So uh, Germany three third at last year's Worlds, third in this regatta at the moment. So fair play to them. The last year's World Championship uh, World Championship winners, the Fantellas, in 12th so far in this race and second at last year's Worlds in 20th so maybe that speaks to the strength in depth. Ah, but they're only 20 points apart on the scoreboard so right. it's uh, you know it's, this just shows how competitive it is is all really. Uh, we had over you know roughly 90 boats at last year's world so uh, six or seven of those 12 races were in three fleet qualifying which again they all make gold means they all have a shot and then you had i can't remember if it was five or six boats in gold fleet to to decide everything and uh, there's plenty of teams who can do it we just saw that in the 49er fx racing early this morning uh very uh mixed up scoreboard and uh you know you get your lane you get your the difference between uh sort of hero zero and hero is whether or not you get that pin spot right because uh, if you get off the pin you, you can win a race and if you don't well you're back in the pack so we see the spanish boat on the right a picture next to its coach boat we just changed there just trying to work out this is graph here third overall in the okay. orange jerseys looking uh, comfortable on home waters home training waters anyways it's a very strong german squad right now working very well together and uh, eric Hall and tommy plissel they were so pleased that with the work that uh, just as Smith and Max Berm did for them to help them win that bronze medal in Rio 2016, that they were actually talking about cutting the bronze medal in half and giving half of it to the uh, to their training partners. But um, I forget which way round it was. One of them, either Eric or Tommy, said, "Hang on, this is our bronze medal. We're not going to cut it in half. But what we are going to do is get a cast made of it." So they had replicas made, and they gave replicas of their real bronze medals to their training partners. Patent pending. Patent pending, yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, possibly others are available, but um, uh, very expensive. But, but now the training group, having, having seen the power of working together and all working towards that one single spot, um, the Germans are working together better than ever. And uh, I mean, at some of the regattas this year, we've seen sometimes uh, four or five Germans in the top 10. Well, we're seeing that 
you know, the Danish and the Dutch really got that squad thing going to a point where uh, everyone believed it um, a, a couple of quads ago in, in both the skiff classes. And now it's really permeating through more and more of the fleets. Also, the Aussies with Nathan Outer, led by Nathan Outerage, had a strong squad. Uh, but now uh, we're seeing that more and more. Like you say, the French, the Germans, the Kiwis are also working as a very strong squad right now. They've got four boats in the top six of this regatta. And, um, you know, the, the trade-off is that uh, only one of your squad gets to go to the games, but for the nation, what's what's really important is that actually the coach and those sailors who do retain in the program just keep so much knowledge that you can actually have some sort of sustainability. So, the, you know, it, it takes a lot of pushing from an MNA to have rivals for an Olympic berth trained together. Uh, I don't think we're seeing that from Britain right now. I don't think Fletcher and Bithill and, and Peters and uh, Sterrett are training together. And uh, ultimately, that means the m has to provide two sets of coaching. Possibly the learning curve isn't as quick with international training partners. Uh, debatable, I suppose. Depends on how, and how well the international training partners get along. Uh, but it's a challenge for an m and certainly. And, and uh, they want to just use that one coach plus a very strong squad of three to five boats. Well, you make a very good point about the British. Um, in 2017, uh, Dylan Fletcher and Stu Bithell were working and training very closely together with James Peters and Finn Sterrett, working under the same coach, Ben Rhodes, former world champion, went twice to the Games uh, for Great Britain, just missed out on a medal himself. And working in that tight-knit squad, they came first and second at the World Championships in 2017, first and second at the European Championships. The Brits were winning everything in 2017. The end of that year, I won't tell you which, but one of those two teams said, hang on, we want this coach to ourselves. We don't like this joint setup. We're giving away too much. We're not getting enough back. And both teams didn't have as good a 2018 season. Um, so you, you Having said that, I th we did just see them do have a very strong European Championship with coming second and third. So, oh, so things are coming back for them. So I'm not saying the wheels are completely falling falling off. Not by any, not by any stretch. But 2017, sorry, 2018 didn't go so well. Now, meanwhile, uh, we're hearing that there may not be any more racing. If uh, if I get any more word in my ear, then I will uh, I'll update you. But it, it sounds like we might be. Uh, Losing the opportunity to get some racing here. No black flag, no race. Just waiting for confirmation on that. Yes, you're, you're not going to let up about the missed opportunity with the, the black flag, are you, Ben? You know, it, it doesn't ultimately matter because maybe the race would have been so light anyways. It would have been a bit of a travesty. But uh, certainly the wind speed didn't change that much in that five minutes uh, to, to make the decision. And, and ultimately the fleet, you know, pushing the line, yeah, you can blame. They, they're equally sharing the blame. But uh, all of us get to lose out on getting to watch it. But that's okay. Well, yeah, we would have loved to have seen a bit of this racing. We're, we're, I haven't fully given up hope yet. We saw perfectly valid racing from the FX fleet just now. It was light, but it was, it was doable. And as you said just now, um, if it's good enough for the FXs, it should be good enough for the 49ers because they've got a bit more power in the rigs. Yeah, I mean, it's 5.30 p.m. local time. Uh, this is a sea breeze fighting a gradient. So, you know, it's about this time of night that, that usually the, the cookers turn off and, and, the, and what's powering the, the sea breeze uh, starts to die off. And we saw how light it was in the 49er FX racing that any loss of wind strength could make it unviable to race. And... And unfortunately, I, I can't see a reason that's going to bring that breeze back in. So uh, could, if, once it gets too low, I don't think we're going to get it back. So uh, we've had two really interesting FX races and that one aborted start for the start of the gold fleet in the 49er men. Uh, really has been an amazing regatta so far, though, Ben. And uh, is, are we seeing the start of a new trend? Uh, global warming, is it playing into the hands of Kiel Avocker and and making Kiel Week more attractive than its rainy past? You know, I think that first day the, the meteorologist called it a meteorological miracle because it was actually just a gradient driven by a high on one side of uh, Germany and on a low on the other. The miracle part being that there was no clouds and rain that came with it. Um, so I think it's a little early to say that uh, Kiel has changed its colors because uh, often we do get the the high sitting over Kiel and it's hot and there's no wind uh, like we're seeing right now or the systems like we saw yesterday. So 
But what I'm hearing for the weekend is that the hot weather's coming back. We thought it's warm today. It's getting hotter tomorrow and even hotter on Sunday for the medal races. And it's coming in with a good chunk of breeze as well. So, California, here we come, part two. I mean, let's let, keep fingers crossed for that. It could be really good on the weekend. It could be really good, and let's hope it, let's hope it is, because we've got uh, 90 of the world's best 49er sailors ready to compete it out. Uh, we saw the FX sailors get their chance in the slight winds and, uh, and see... Uh, them emerge uh, versus each other but uh, I'm just looking at our wind graphic here and it's shaking all over the place uh, showing real instability on the water I think we're in real trouble to see any wind there that's uh, our producer there putting that up but that is uh, I just saw it I mean it's already 30 degrees uh, of what the course is set up for and uh, and da look at it dancing all over the place that can only happen in incredibly light wind so well we got 15 minutes where we're going to just uh, give it another window to see if we can get some racing in. Um, we were watching that NACRA racing earlier earlier on. I don't, I don't know if there's a chance of watching more of that, but uh, probably don't have time for that. But I'll, I'll, I'll wait and hear if there's an opportunity to see any more of yesterday's NACRA racing. What do you reckon, Ben? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's fair of the race officer to keep everyone uh, afloat a few more minutes. There's no need to give up. Maybe the wind will come through. And uh, while we wait, I think uh, getting to watch the last half of that uh, third NACA race that we broke off from to jump into the 49er FX racing would be a good use of our time. So I hope out there you stick with us. And uh, certainly the, I know the NACA racing was exciting yesterday uh, because it's a replay. Uh, certainly uh, seat, of your ed seat of your pants stuff compared yeah. to this uh, tactical racing in the 49er. So... Um, well worth our time to watch it again. All right. So we'll, we'll see if we can tee up that NACRA race and, uh, and bring that to you. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep you entertained with that. And if you don't know the result, it's, it's well worth a watch. Absolutely. In fact, it's well worth a watch even if you do know the result. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's given us a little bit of everything so far, hasn't it, Kiel Week? We've had the, the light winds today. We've had the, the strong winds other days. Okay, let's see if we can roll into that macro race. So we're already heading downwind to remind everyone we've got two boats out in front and Thomas Sajak uh, there in the Austrian flagged boat in, uh, in about third place. Pacheco and Trittle from Spain in the lead with Koloff and Stuhlhammer following them straight down the middle of the course. And uh, we get to see a real drag race here to the bottom mark. We see Bizarro and Frascari. Uh, Frascari recovering from her injury in the second race to, to challenge on the far side of the course there as the fleet hurdles downwind at maximum speed here. The Japanese looking really fast on the far side. They've got one hull in the water, though, whereas the Spanish and the Germans are foiling a little bit more upright. And the Spanish absolutely on the charge with their white Jenica on the left of picture. I love how in control these two teams are. Germans and the Spanish just dead steady, pushing as hard as they can to get maximum speed and depth out of their boats. Both boats in excess of 20 knots right now. Um, as they set up for the end of the run here, really, I mean, it, there won't be too much long, but full attention has to be paid to keeping the boat stable. There are no automatic stabilizers, no trim tabs, so it's uh, all reliant on the crew trim, both sheets and body movement to keep that boat steady. Now, if the Spanish are on ley line and they don't need to do any further jibes, that is a very, very well-called ley line. It must be extremely difficult to do at the speeds that they're doing. And it is. We see the Spanish going for their drop. Just falling off the foils there a tiny bit messy as they come into the lured marks, but keeping their momentum so they won't have lost much time or distance as they round in the lead. Looking very good there and going to their favorite side of the course, the right-hand side, of course. And now we see Koloff and Stuhlemmer going the opposite gate, and we have seen these two teams favor the opposite sides of the course all day. Yes, yeah, so um, there's not enough distance for the Spanish to be able to put a covering tack on, so uh, maybe the Spanish will keep faith with the right-hand side, the Germans charging out to the left with the rest of the fleet a bit of a wheelie there behind us on one of the uh, i think it's one of the austrian boats did a bit of a wheelie just there this austrian boat zajak and Mats in third place going around the far track of the danes sayuma pedersen and boriskov the finns coming round, kurt bay and kesten coming around this mark followed by bizarro and frascari still recovering from that mishap in the previous race but very much in the hunt 
the fleet split in two here. Half the boat's going right, half the boat's going left. So uh, not a lot of agreement on the best way up this course. It is shifty and offshore, of course. So, uh, and good racing from Zajac and Mats. They, we've seen them be very consistent so far in the day. I, they haven't had a race so far outside the top three in this whole regatta. And they're back in third place for this race. And there's two boats with Tiffon, French Tiffon at the back. There seems to be a Tiffon match race going on at the back. But up with the leaders, this is Kolov Stulema. Look how flat they're trapezing. Ben, I'm all just sitting up to look, see what's going on. But yeah. apart from that, very, very, uh, very flat, very low profile aerodynamic. Hard charging. And uh, the two of them are uh, very committed to this side of the course here where the uh where the you know it has actually i think been favored most of the day we see them just going under their tack so we already know that the spanish uh, went to the far side and are, and are coming at them so let's see what uh let's see if they if the, who will be in the lead here once the two boats come together very smooth tack there i love how late these natural crews go across the boat as you said ben it's, it's about trying to lift that new windward hull out of the water as much as possible. So it's almost a roll tack that they do. Actually, Oh, hang on. What's going on here? They're going for both uh, hulls out of the water. They've gone into a different mode here, and now they're fully foiling up wind. We don't see that a lot, and you can see they've brought the boat back to flat uh, to get both sets of verticals in the water, and now they're charging across the course. Look at the wind speed, uh, the boat speed. Boat speed almost up to 15 knots. Most of the other boats doing around 10 knots. Begs the question, Ben, why don't they do that all the time? My goodness, and it looks like they've pulled a big lead on uh, uh, Pacheco and Triddle. They were tied with them uh, on the virtual just moments ago, and now they're charging across the course up to three, three and a half knots faster, uh, and it looks like at a very good angle as well. So they probably got a bit of a left shift along with, uh, with the puff, I suppose, uh, but very powerful stuff here from the Germans. They hit the turbo boost, and they're just leaving the rest dead in the water. It's just incredible the game they've made here. It looks like they've sat back down here. Their speed's back to the typical upwind speeds of everyone else. So just a 30, 45 second boost of full foiling. And uh, look at the lead they've built up incredibly quickly. So the Spanish, they look out of it. I mean, I'm sure they're in a battle for second or third, but uh, they were leading at the bottom gate. And now, just two minutes later, these Germans are back down in the water. They're not foiling now. In fact, leaning over a little bit. But it just suddenly put that turn of speed on. And, it, and if we look at the difference between Pacheco uh, and Triddle versus Zajac and Mats, neither of those boats uh, you know, have changed their relative positions to each other. So it's, it's like the Germans just turned on the turbo. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you'll be keen to uh, ask them about that afterwards, Ben. And in fact, you hinted that those very Germans might be the ones that we'd see do that. So you must have seen them do this before. But I haven't heard it talked about an awful lot. They, um, they did it in the 2017 Worlds, which was a very flat water venue as well in the Mediterranean, uh, but it did get windy on a couple of opportunities, and I think they won the medal race based on it uh, back then. So there, there is a narrow window where it's working these days, and no doubt with skills, uh, they will be you know, increasing that window, I suppose, but it looked like a very powerful tool there, and I'm surprised it doesn't come out more often if it can be that useful. Well, um, Koloff is very tall. I don't know if that's anything to do with it. Have they got more rising moment because of that? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, he's pretty tall, but you know, like the crew, Alyssa is not so tall. So I wouldn't have said that they uh, were abnormally sized for by, by comparison to most of the boats. And, and anyways, in a catamaran, the catamaran, the boat itself provides quite a bit of the riding motion. So I'd be surprised if. Um, be surprised if their leverage was anything substantially different. Look at the lead they've built up here. I mean, they were tied with Pacheco and Trittle. That can't just be about the turbo. There boost must have there must have been a, a shift or something as well. But uh, but you know they're running away with it now, and they were in a boat race just a moment ago. Yeah. Well, here they are, uh, making their approach to the windward mark. Clearly in the lead. No threat whatsoever. How does that affect the way they go about the hoist? Well, it doesn't change the fact that they get the kite out to the end of the line. It always looks a bit alarming to me how it's blowing around like that. Alisa Strulema jumping in to hoist. Bit of a lean over. But yeah, Up they and get... foiling. No problems. And it all looks quite gentle at this point, doesn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, that's the skills of having the, the setup right. But uh, let me see Zajac and Mats uh, making a pass on the Spanish. So clearly the right side wasn't the way to go on this beat. Uh, as we see Zajac and Mats uh, make the pass, they were, they went to the same side of the course there, the left, as did the Germans. Uh, good, Like we said, good racing from this team. They've uh, had so far three-thirds and a second. Uh, sorry, and two seconds in their regatta so far. And uh, looking for another good race here. Getting out onto the trapeze. Zajac joining Barbara Matz, Austria 3, third in last year's World Championship. Currently in uh, second in this race. They actually got a string of threes yesterday. So that three seems to be their favorite number. They're, they're beating their favorite number right now as they get the Jenica up. And Barbara Matz actually staying on the side of the boat as they do the hoist. So quite different to the way that we saw Elisa Stulema go about that. Yeah, that's interesting. Trapezing the whole way around, so uh, obviously somehow able to reach all the different ropes from her trapezing position, so uh, they, the teams do have a lot of freedom in how they can lead uh, all their ropes on these catamarans, all the different uh, sheets and hides and uh, and whatnot. So uh, obviously that's something that the Germans have been working on, so they can stay on the wire the whole way around, and you know, I think foil, keeping foiling is obviously the name of the game, and uh, maybe keeping the crew weight uh, consistently on the side is something that they think can help them stay on the foils for more frequently as they're going through all the maneuvers of setting the, sp the new sail. Well, there's certainly no hard and fast way to do these hoists. We're seeing very different techniques of the Wimble Bar. And we're seeing different styles downward as well. I, I don't think I see anybody else doing as much backwards and forwards running as Barbara Matz that we see here. Yeah, she's really tap dancing, and, uh, and we see Thomas at the back not doing a tremendous amount of movement. So well, less decisive movements from the two of them, uh, more, more huddling around that one pivot point. Meanwhile, at the bottom, Koloff and Stulema, just a couple of minutes, and they're already at the bottom of the run, absolutely charging downwind, doing, doing in excess of 20 knots, not fully falling there, not falling as high as they normally do. Could be that they've uh, got a half a kilometer lead and are just uh, keeping things safe right now. So uh, yeah, do you, do you think that, that you sort of uh, let it run a little bit looser, a little bit higher above the water? Oh, nice, nice jibe there, but a brief jump onto the trapeze just to keep the boat flat. Yeah, it's certainly a safer mode the lower you are, so uh, they wouldn't be looking to, to push things too hard with such a big lead. And uh, and anyways, they're probably setting up for the, the, the douse and, and not too worried about the ends of boat speed uh, right at the bottom there. Good rounding, though, very strong. Uh, I suppose they'll just uh, head back out to the left side. Uh, Why would you do anything different? <laughs> yeah, and, It's uh, worked so well for them all day. Yeah, and we see... We see Zajek and Mats uh, also extending there on uh, Chittal and Pacheco. So good. Back in fifth there, with. we see uh, Bissar and Frascari. So coming off that injury to Pascari, um, you know, not their best race, but certainly competitive. And uh, fifth place finish will be, uh, or fifth place positioning keeps them in the regatta. A oh, little bit of a bobble loose, there. A little bit of a bobble there on the, getting the spinnaker around. Uh, so. But back under control of the Austrians, getting the Jenica down for the lure drop. Bit slow getting that Jenica down, so uh, not quite as smooth around as the Germans in the lead. But no disaster. No, certainly a good run from them. Uh, we saw right from the top of the uh, top of the course they were foiling, you know, the whole time, and, and no disasters downwind. Uh, relatively smooth around the lured marks, so. Solid sailing from Zajek and Mats, as uh, we've seen that through the whole regatta so far. Koloff and Stulema, some way ahead of Polgar and Werner, who probably are considered to be their closest rival for Olympic selection. So, um, although we don't think that this actually counts for anything particular, the result of Kilovaka, certainly Koloff and Stulema showing that they have some world-class pace at their disposal. When you've got people like Bissaro and Frascari to compare yourself against and you're beating them, then you know that you're somewhere close to the pace. Yeah, and this team hasn't been full-time sailing the whole quad. Uh, they've been doing some studying uh, and, uh, and therefore part-time sailing. So they, they are now uh, back into full-time sailing, and uh, I think the world should be worried with uh, this kind of pace they've shown, and uh, especially if they uh, can get that turbo mode working more frequently. Well, no turbo mode to be seen at the moment. We'll see if they turn it on on the other tack. I, I would have thought, why not just use it and get the race over and done with? <laughs> 
Yeah, no doubt. Uh, well, at least be, be practicing it and, and learning on it. But maybe uh, maybe the middle of a important championship uh, like this isn't the time to be practicing and, and just uh, sailing the smart way to win is the way to go. Well, I wonder how much risk is attached to using it. Like it might be faster, but does it put you at greater risk of? of maybe uh, crashing the boat as well. I, I, the teams say it's incredibly stable, actually. So the boat gets more stable when they're foiling because there's no waves interfering with things. I think the risk uh, is that they, you can lose depth and you can get out of a proper upwind lane and a proper close hauled lane, uh, possibly without knowing it. The, the apparent wind is so far forward uh, that you can be a few degrees off what you need to be and not really know it for, for extended periods of time. And then you end up losing distance uh, pretty quickly. But uh, you'd think that'd be the type of thing you'd work on and, and just get so good at it, you don't have to worry. Yeah, completely. Austria in second place. Going up the uh, middle of the beat, not going as far as the uh, Germans. Just uh, just slightly interrupted there on our replay. So uh, we're still waiting for the 49er decision to see if there's been any racing, if there's going to be any racing today. And uh, So, uh, no, we, we have just heard that there will be no more racing today. Um, so, uh, anyway, that sounds like it's going to be it for the day, which is a bit of a shame that we... Uh, to be a total spoiler, I don't think anything else happens in that NACA race except for Bizarro and Frascari move up to fourth. So uh, that, w once again, was a replay from yesterday. And, uh, uh, you know, I hope you found it entertaining. We wanted to get it back up on the airwaves. And uh, we are done for the day in terms of our racing. Okay, so uh, for you, what was the high point? We saw um, two teams that I certainly don't know, perhaps as well as you do, being the, uh, the class manager. But um, who, who was the standout performer from today? Well, the standout performer today was uh, Nielsen and Olsen, two, a pair of second places, totally committed to their strategy of, of hitting that left side of the course and uh, doing very few maneuvers, uh, extending the ley lines. That worked a treat for those two. Uh, I was also very happy to, happy to see the Croatian team uh, take a victory because uh, that's not an easy thing to do in a gold fleet race. And, uh, and of course, very impressed with Jursok and Lorenz, who... Uh, you know, pulled out a very good lead over the heavier racing, now have come into the light racing and not put a foot of foul. Uh, two solid races from them, setting themselves up for a championship victory on home waters. Well, that would be very nice for Jörg and Lawrence if, if they could do that. The Germans seem to be rising to the occasion on home waters. We hope you'd enjoyed the racing, albeit it's been at a slightly different speed to some of the racing we've seen on other days. But from what we hear from the forecast, not only is the sunshine going to burn more brightly over the weekend, the wind is going to be blowing harder as well. So uh, join us for the final weekend of Kiel Avoca. With me has been Ben Ramoka. I'm Andy Rice. We'll be back to you tomorrow morning. The temperature might have been cooler in Kiel, but Thursday's races were running hot. Today was the turn of the NACRA 17, a spectacular catamaran capable of up to 50 kilometers an hour above the water. Germany's most promising candidates for Tokyo 2020 are here. Johannes Polgar and Karolina Werner, along with Paul Koloff and Alisa Strulema. In the first race, Koloff and Strulema won the start but had to give up their lead. The teams from Denmark and Italy pulled off better maneuvers than the German duo. The Danish team almost capsized, but got away with it. The Italians managed to overtake on the second downwind leg, going on to win the first race comfortably. Further back, the German teams were fighting their own battle and finished fourth and seventh respectively. We had a lot of fun. We were in the groove. That was very important for us. On the next downwind leg, we didn't let anyone overtake us. In the second race, Polgar and Werner were over the line too early, so they were disqualified. It was even more unfortunate for the Italian team. Maeli Frascari fell off the trapeze in the midst of a jiving duel with Koloff and Stulema. We were fighting with for top spot. We had very fast falling jibe and probably when uh, she was uh, she were trying to be as fast as possible outside on trapeze, she missed the hook and just uh, dropped in the water. 
The Germans narrowly avoided a capsize, then ensued a classic match race in the third race between Kolov Stulema and the Spaniards Pacheco and Trito. After a great mark rounding, the German duo got their boat foiling upwind and launched themselves to another victory. We have strong competitors here and we're really enjoying racing with them. Celebrating their second place across the finish, the Austrians did a bit of showboating for the crowd, as Thomas Zajac explained. My crew, Babsi, is always looking forwards, and I like to shock her a little bit. Consistent scores in the top three places Zajac and Mats in third overall, and the Austrians are loving their time at Kiel Week.